Hello, Paul. Welcome to my home. Hey, Mason. I see you didn't bother to clean up at all. Nope, but I did order a pizza. A real one, not one of these frozen things that you make for us. If you want to make them real good, you gotta make them from scratch. Noted, Elvis. Hello, welcome in. Did you throw away that hamburger I found on the top of your bookshelf? Yes, Lowry. Actually, wait, hang on. Yes, Lowry. It weirds me out how fast food never seems to age. Speaking of never aging, as you can all see, I'm not dressed as a vampire. You should be, though. I mean, just for fun. Who says Halloween's the only time you can be a vampire? To be honest, Elvis, the LARPing scene for vampire games is pretty crazy. I'd rather not. We could start our own, where everyone has to dress like Dracula. And then we could fool the mortals by spelling our names backwards and insisting that we have a sun allergy. My favorite vampire thing is where they have rice grains or poppy seeds. You trade your soul for satanic power and also OCD. It's just not in the devil's character to make life better for people, Paul. You can have your power, transform into a wolf at will, but only if you become a shut-in who compulsively washes his hands. I think this is why vampire games appeal to so many people who already suffer from those drawbacks. It's like, you keep living how you always do, but also you can hypnotize girls. I bet the devil comes up with different drawbacks for those guys. You have to go to a club and mingle for a half hour every week, or else you disintegrate into dust. Ugh, gross. Vampire powers don't sound worth it now. So speaking of neurosis, I've been thinking about the character descriptions that you guys gave me. Paul and Elvis, you guys agreed to work together, and then Lowry chose a totally unrelated character motive. Yeah, good luck, chump. What are you gonna do about it? You'll find out. Elvis and Paul, the two of you live down in the city sewers like a pair of ninja turtles on meth. You've dammed off a little basin area, packed it with your stuff, and somehow run an internet cable down there so you can live stream. This is essential because the both of you run a live advice VTuber stream where you pose as big titty anime girls who are having constant fake spats with other cartoon girls. You've developed a massive following for reasons only a computer program could explain, and you're doing quite well financially. You're currently in the middle of an episode now. Paul, how's it going? And anyway, I'm just saying that's why big cream cheese is key to defeating China. Disable the crab rangoons and they lose their essential appetizer resources with no hope of recovery. It's a complete no-brainer. I'm sure the government would already be in the process of doing it if they weren't secretly all controlled by the same cabal of wicked antelope men from Lemuria. That's right, Paul. A lot of people don't give that type of stuff enough thought around Father's Day, so it's, it's really important that we bring that up and we just keep it in everyone's minds. Happy Father's Day. Call your dads. But before you call them, you can call us. Now's the part of the show where we invite people onto our voice chat to ask for help or do an interview. First up, we've got Big Skidoo. Welcome to the show, Big Skidoo. Hey, when are you guys going to wrap this up and get me my delivery? Oh, I think this is a question for Paul. Thanks, Elvis. Yeah, uh, Lowry, we told you never to call into our show for stuff like this. You have my phone number. You can send me a text. You never read your text during your shows, Paul. When are you delivering my food? Frank can't start on my dinner without ingredients. Lowry, dude, you should have a fridge full of stuff. Unless somebody took it, but I can't imagine who would break into your house and steal nothing but your food. Sorry about this, listeners. Paul has a little side hustle. He likes to stay out in the world, so he does, you know, food deliveries. You see, Elvis, it's all about relative velocity. If you're in the world, you can rest, because you're moving with it. But if you're on the outside, you gotta be constantly running to keep up. Or you could just give up on running. That's what I did. I know it is, bud. Well, listen, I have leftovers, but I'm not an animal. I'm not going to be reduced to fishing yesterday's lunch out of the back of the fridge. Make a stop here as soon as your show is over. And don't try to make conversation with me this time. I hang up. I love that guy. He's got a jacuzzi with a malachite pattern exterior. And when you take a bath in that thing, you feel like a million bucks. I don't think you're supposed to bathe in a jacuzzi, Paul. Elvis, that's just a trick they get you to buy a bathtub and a jacuzzi at the same time. Or one of those two-in-one jacuzzi-bathtub combos. But this is America, the land of the free. The unwritten laws separating jacuzzi from bathtub or combining them into one are completely unenforceable. Imagine if it were enforced legally, which would be just another example of government overreach. Everyone, they could be cracking down on your freedom to bathe yourself. How much more basic and essential can your rights get? If you guys care at all, and I know that you do, write your congressman angry letters telling them that you're tired of being forced to separate bathtubs from jacuzzis or being forced to combine them into one unit. Our local guy, Congressman Dickerson, just loves the heck out of us. We have no idea why. Oh, there he is in the chat. Hello, Congressman Dickerson. I hope you fall down a flight of stairs. He says, LOL, love the show. I'm 100% against mandates on jacuzzis and always have been. 
Don't you lie to us. Anyway, our next guy is named Amber Alert. We you. We're gonna call you Amber. What do you want to talk about, Amber? Drop dead, Dickerson. Yeah, drop dead, Dickerson. Anyway, I just want to tell you guys, I think you're amazing. Thanks. Did you have some kind of problem you wanted advice with? Yeah, it's about lizard people. Everybody says that they rule the world, but they're not very emotional, you know? I mean, lizard people, I mean. It's the cold blood thing, I think. You know, this is the only talk doodad that I listen to that knows that animal people are mammals. Well, it just makes sense. Crossing a person with a lizard would involve moving around a lot more stuff. But crossing a man with a wombat, we're basically cousins. Exactly. Exactly. See, and plus, a lot of mammals have basic pack instincts, which makes it easier to cooperate with them. That's great and all, but what's your question, dude? Oh, yeah, yeah, so mammals. Like, I get mammals. But what about birds? Like a bird person? What if they ran the world behind the scenes? Yeah, like, hypothetically, let's say I know a guy, and I'm trying to get him to cooperate, but he's got this big ego, and it's just a whole thing, right? You're trying to cooperate with the bird that runs the upper echelons of society? Yeah, I suppose. Okay, and you're sure this guy's a bird? Yeah, 100%. Well, birds like songs. Have you tried singing to him? He's really more like a vulture. He's not that into song. Well, if I know anything about rich people and birds, it's that money is always meaningless to them, except as a metric to measure their success against other birds, and that they'll chew the soft parts of their cage that they're in. Normally, you just buy him some toys to chew on, but since this bird can buy his own stuff, what you'll need to do is set up an amazing chewing experience that he hasn't had before. A chewing experience? Wow, you know, I haven't thought of that before. That or you could set him up with a mate or a nesting box. Nah, he's already been divorced once. He's not looking to remarry. Then in that case, set him up with a cruise liner to a secret island where he can chew on stuff beyond his wildest imagination. All right, I think you're on to something. See, you're the real guys who know what's going on. I don't know how you know, but you know. Thanks for joining us. That's it for our show today. All right, bye. Thanks for all your help. I turn off the show. Man, Elvis, I tell you, we get some real crazies calling in. Bird people. Can you believe that? I'm not sure what parts I'm supposed to believe anymore, but from the context clues from your emphasis on things, I, I don't believe in bird people. Yeah, right. I mean, obviously when I talk about animal people, I mean werewolves. Who else would I be talking about? People don't turn into birds with the full moon. Yeah, like a bird person would have to see a, a full mango. Exactly. And then you're only ruling over Australia, or wherever mangoes are from. Anyway, I gotta get down to the store and pick up some food for Lowry. You wanna come with me? Sure. We gonna stop off at the gas station? Elvis, it would not be a trip above ground if we didn't. Alright, you guys make your way out of your damp, spider-infested sewer home and climb your way up a rusty ladder to the surface. You're in the rundown outskirts where car and foot traffic is low, and you find yourselves under the pale glow of a gas station streetlight. Man, Elvis, I'm telling you, we need to get ourselves a house. We can afford one these days, can't we? Yeah, but then we gotta sit in with some people. And our darkness has twisted our faces to the extent that it looks like a bullfrog had kids with a car accident and then we couldn't afford to get braces. They're never gonna give a loan to someone who can't afford braces. So we could buy it with cash then, right? We do it online, pretend we're foreign investors. Oh, right, the internet. Yeah, I don't know if we can do that. I'll look into that. The frickin' internet. Everything's on camera these days. It's getting harder and harder to be secret vampires that live in the underground. Mason, I go in the gas station, carefully navigate around the camera, and put a piece of wet gum over the lens. As per a common ritual, you cover the security camera so your coming and going isn't recorded. Of course, because of your supernatural ability to evade notice by mortals, you walk right past the clerk and a guy looking for ding-dongs, and nobody mentions a thing. I go straight to the Slurpee machine, put my head under the cherry nozzle, and just help myself as much as I can. You put your dirty mouth on what is, let's be honest, probably an already very dirty machine, and start guzzling down. You don't get much in before you feel nausea and cramping. Hey, hang on, hang on. Elvis, I, 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 I gotta be right back. Run to the bathroom. While Paula's doing that, I open a bag of M&Ms and start separating all the colors on the counter. <laughs> oh, 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 God. Oh, it's cold coming up. <laughs> you throw it all up. And now the area around your mouth is all red. Uh, flush the cherry slurpee. I love you, cherry. I just wish we could be together longer. Go back, grab a big gulp, fill it up with cherry slurpee. Okay, Elvis, I'm ready. Let's get going. All right, just about done. And there we go. All the colors nice and separated. We head out the door. See you, Phil. Stay confident, bud. Phil, presumably the clerk, neither hears nor acknowledges you. Though you know by now that you guys are driving him crazy, and he's going to wonder who left a bunch of M&Ms on his counter. 
Do you take the gum down? Nope, that's Phil's problem. Our next stop is the city hospital, where we'll make a classic vampire withdrawal from the blood bank. I sip on my Slurpee along the way, and then just throw up in the gutters. I don't know how many times I said you gotta get off that stuff, Paul. We can't let mortals have all the good things, Elvis. Think about all the crazy foods we're missing out on. I mean, you say that, but drinking blood's got a kind of, you know, like R-rating feeling to it. You know? I mean, I don't see how Cherry Slurpee competes. You just don't understand principle. <laughs> oh god, I wish it was so cool. You guys get to go into the blood bank, walk right in like you own the place, scoop up a few packets, and leave without anyone being the wiser. All right, now we gotta get uptown to Lowry's place, which means we have to hop on a bus. It's about time. You guys find some empty seats, and everyone kind of avoids you subconsciously. You practically don't need your powers for this bit, since you look dirty and homeless, and everyone would avoid you anyway. You get uptown to the high rises and good living. See, Elvis, Lowry likes to live like we ought to live, but not overlooking the city. We could live anywhere. I want to live by a lake, own a tire swing. I kind of like our location close to the hospital. Lakes are nice, but cities are walkable, Pa. I mean, you want to stand for a picture for a driver's license? You'll show up and then they'll know what you look like. Man, this is why European vampires have it easy. Everything's near the trains. Anyway, let's give our buddy Lowry this delivery. Lowry, you're a high-powered business person who only comes out at night, and his job is afforded one penthouse downtown. What have you been up to while waiting for Paul and Elvis? Yelling at my bartender, Frank? Listen to me, it's exactly two parts whiskey, one part vermouth, and a dash of bitters, and three cherries! Do you understand? You think this wouldn't be difficult, but if you mess it up, I will know the difference. I can't drink it, Frank. My vampire tummy is very sensitive. I wish there was some other part of you that was sensitive. I'm sorry, what? I said I know how to make a Manhattan. It's usually only one or two cherries, and I wish that you were more sensitive emotionally. Look at me, Frank. Your life depends on me being able to drink that drink and keep it down. Do you understand? And how dare you say I'm not emotionally sensitive? I noticed your haircut today. I said it was nice. That's not the same. That's just being perceptive. The fact I was nice about it is me being sensitive to you, okay? It's not even that nice of a haircut. I was just trying to make you feel good. Oh, really? Yes, really. Now mix that drink like your life depends on it because I swear, if you mess it up again, I will kill you. You say that about everything. Because I will actually kill you and drink your blood, Frank. Not if nobody's there to mix it for you. Frank, you... Grab a cabinet full of glass and dishware, then yank it down in anger. You angrily destroy an entire cabinet's worth of plates. Don't remind me of my weaknesses, Frank. I have a lot of work to do. I lost the beans and Tupperware account last week, and I am under a lot of stress. Paul and Elvis, you guys sort of let yourselves through the front door into a small disaster zone. I guess we step around the busted ceramic and throw some blood packets into the fridge. Neither Lowry nor Frank can see you unless you allow it, so the blood gets delivered out of nowhere, whenever they find it. Try and find a plate that's not broken. Hey boss, if you're throwing these out, can we take some? Ugh. Oh my god, Paul, where are you? How many times do I have to tell you, knock first so I know you're here, then don't be seen? How do you get this confused with bring a friend and then make it a garage sale? Sorry, boss. I was going to knock on my way out. Oh, there you are. Why am I looking at you? All I need for you to do is slam your own fingers in the door, okay? Sure thing. Uh, but I'll do it on my way out so you're not bothered by my howling and whimpering. Mason, I disappear so hard that Lowry forgets I was even there, and then I steal a couple of plates. I vanish too, but I don't leave. Hang on, Elvis. Whenever I do this job, I like to hang out and listen for a while. This guy does a bunch of private equity and other business stuff. I can never figure out who's selling who or who he works for, but as soon as I get bored, I hide the remote and then set the microwave clock forward by one minute. Mason, I go to the fridge, get a blood packet. I've got others that aren't as fresh, but I'm never going to touch those. Leftovers are for the lower class. Set the packet down in front of Frank. All right, it's three parts blood and one cherry for each part of blood. Do you get it? It's not that hard to understand. You do it wrong and everything is ruined. Okay, I got it, boss. He mixes up a drink and hands it to you. So you lost beans and Tupperware, huh? Oh, don't even get me started. Some little firm called Cheesley Ratman and Associates pulled the rug out from underneath me. It's ridiculous. They're obviously just taking a loss and then deducting it for taxes. That really sucks, boss. Oh, shut up, Frank. You don't know anything. Except how to make a drink, I guess. Let's be reasonable. You can't even do that. Frank hands you a glass of blood cocktail, and when you take a sip, it's actually perfect. You know it is, because if it weren't, you'd be vomiting right now. 
Your body can't process any of these ingredients unless it's mixed with the blood to the point of ritual excellence. Uh, it's barely passable, Frank. Aw, oh, that's no way to talk to your employees. Mason, I steal Lowry's wallet, take out $20, and then put it in Frank's wallet. Sure. Nobody notices you doing this unless you want them to. Not even Paul. Nah, Paul doesn't need to know either. It'll just be my own little good deed. I set the microwave forward one minute, then hide the TV remote. And I guess I wander off to my computer, make some phone calls, and actually do some business. Alright, it's all boring after this. Let's go, Elvis. Lowry gets to work and you guys leave. You ride the bus back to your moldering little home, climb back down into your sewers, and then Elvis... You notice that one of the VR headsets is gone. It's not where you left it. As you're looking around, you can't find it in any logical place. Uh, okay. Hey, Paul? Have you seen the second headset? We can't do our thing tomorrow without it. Man, I don't know. It's wherever it is. See, that's the thing, though. It's not wherever it is. It's somewhere else, and I can't find it. Can you help me look? A soda can falls off your table, clanking along the floor as though something knocked it down. Whose soda can is that? We can't drink soda. It makes us bark. Paul, is that your soda? Are you getting started on something else? I only drink cherry Slurpee, man. A small, greasy, balding man with a long nose scrambles out from underneath your tablecloth. It's mine! Oh, oh god, oh jeez, I'm sorry! He grabs the can and then sprints into the sewers. On his way out, you guys see he's holding your VR set. We've been robbed! Get him! Mason, chase him down. You guys pursue in the darkness at full tilt. If anyone here were mortal, they wouldn't be able to see a thing, but this guy rounds corners and leaps over trash like he was born down here. Stop! Or I'll shoot you! Paul, do you really have a gun? No. Ah, don't shoot! He keeps running, then dives into a smaller pipe, which he army crawls through with rat-like agility. The two of you come up to the pipe yourselves, and you can see it seems to empty down the line a ways at a higher elevation. Elvis, see if you can circle around to the exit before he gets there. I dive in. You got it! The sewers are maze-like, aren't they? I start running, but I don't know if I know where I'm going. Paul, give me dexterity. Elvis, give me some navigation. Ah, oh, heck, I don't know that. All right, Paul, this guy is gaining ground on you. You've never seen such a pudgy guy shimmy like this before, and you've been to a lot of clubs as part of your work. Dang, man, you ever think about being a dancer? I, uh, I, I don't... What is that supposed to mean? Elvis, you find an incline and you follow it, but you get mixed up and turned around along the way. You come to a stop in front of what looks like the right pipe just as the guy emerges from a completely different pipe behind you. You're gonna have to stamp through a bunch of sewer water to catch up to him. Ah, uh, heck. Hey! Come help pull me out of this, Elvis! I help yank Paul out of the pipe. The guy takes this chance to climb a ladder to a manhole. You pull Paul the rest of the way out. Man, this guy's slick. I don't know who or what he is, but he's got the physicality for a thief, I'll tell you that. The guy bangs on the sewer lid a few times and it pops loose. He clambers out into the city lights. Come on, Elvis, go, 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 go! You find yourselves on a busy street. Cars are honking their horns and everyone's looking at this dude in total surprise. It's not every day a man pops out of the sewer, runs across three lanes of traffic, and then disappears down an alley. Ah, uh, this is gonna get in the nose. Mason, is there a guy on a motorcycle or a scooter or anything like that nearby? Sure, there's a dude on a bright red crotch rocket down the alley. Elvis, check the local buildings for cameras facing the street. If you find one, destroy their hard drive. I run over to the motorcycle, grab the rider by the helmet, and then just elbow him off the thing. I put his helmet on to hide my face, then ride down the alley on the motorcycle. Mason, I start running down the street looking for video cameras. All right, your powers don't hide people-sized things in your possession, so everyone becomes well aware of you as you punch this guy in the face and steal his bike. Likely no one's gonna remember your face, but they're definitely gonna see this theft and where you went. Elvis, you start running down the streets. Ice cream parlor, bar, 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 gay bar. Oh, I see, we're in the entertainment district. And then a bank with an ATM. And sure enough, those always have cameras. Oh, why'd it have to be a bank? Check the front door. Lock. Man, get out my tools. Paul, you catch up to this greasy dude in no time. The headlights on your bike shine dead in his face. His eyes glow like an animal. Hey, hey, look, man. This is a lot to go through over a VR headset, isn't it? I've gone through more trouble for dumber things, man. If you thought I'd be the type to look the other way based on how dumb this is, I'd love to regale you with some hilarious stories. But first, I think you have something that belongs to me. Uh, all right, look, I, I can't give this up. Someone wants it. I, I can't say no. Yeah, that someone is me. Rev the engines. He bolts for the corner of a building and then starts climbing up the brick exterior like a squirrel. Ah, uh, man, come on. I just stole this bike for the chase. Speaking of, you didn't get very far. Just down the alley a little ways, the previous owner of the bike is running towards you with a bloody nose and an angry look on his face. Ah, uh, uh, dang it. Hop off the bike and start climbing up the building after this greaseball. 
stupid supernatural life with its stupid supernatural. I don't need a motorcycle. I climb up vertical surfaces. Sorry, dude. I thought I was going to need it. He picks up his bike and runs back down the street, looking wide-eyed up at the two of you playing King Kong. I disappear so hard that this guy forgets I was there. You hear that motorcycle tear off down the street so fast it leaves skid marks. Elvis, you're in the bank, but you probably tripped the motion sensors. All right, perfect. I'll do this quick. Look for an office. You scan the room and see what looks to be a door to an office. And while you're looking, you also see the security cameras in the interior that now have your face recorded. Oh, uh, oh no. Okay. All right, just run full tilt into the office door and ram it down with my vampire strength. Okay, you gather up as much momentum as you can and wham! You feel something pop in your shoulder, but the door frame splinters. It's a small utility office with a computer. Sit down at the computer, turn it on. Really? Okay. Uh, the computer starts to boot up. Goes through all its little system things as it gets going. Come on, come on! Password screen comes up. Oh, no, the password! Ah, oh, Mason, I type in password. Nope. Bank. Nope. Bank one. Failed. Bank one exclamation mark. You hear a siren. Oh, okay, uh, just grab the entire PC tower and yank it out of the wall. Run out the door with it. With a mighty yank, you tear this PC loose. Then you run to the door and two cops run past you. They don't even notice that you're there. Okay, good. Perfect. All clear. How's the cop car outside parked? Could the dash cam see me? Yeah, they've pulled up to a space that looks directly into the bank. All right, reach in the cop car and steal the dash cam. The windows are rolled up and the door's locked. Headbutt the window. Blam, the window breaks. You grab the dash cam, the cops run outside, you're standing right there, and they look at another guy a few feet away who's gazing onto the scene, bewildered. Hey, the cops say. You see who did this? The guy shakes his head no, and the cops tackle him. Scurry down an alley, dump all this stuff in the dumpster, call Paul. Paul? You climb all the way to the top of this building in pursuit of this grease ball. He seems pretty winded. Wow, I've never seen anyone else climb like that. Are you one of us? All you need to know is I'm gonna throw you right back over the edge of this building if you don't give me that VR set. Actually, wait, Mason, how's this guy carrying my stuff? Oh, uh, it's dangling out of a backpack that he's wearing. He says, look, I don't even care. It's, it's not for the money, I have money. I could buy you another headset, I own my own company. Can your company fill over the wrongness of having my stuff stolen from my own home while I'm still in it? Wait, what's your business? I, I work for a private equity firm, so I got a lot of money, I, I swear. You can look me up, it's Cheesley, Ratman, and Associates. Oh, that sounds really familiar. Are you Cheesley? Yeah, that's me, I, I'm Cheesley. Uh, did you steal a Beans and Tupperware account from some guy named Lowry? Did I? Uh, yeah, yeah, that, that rings a bell, that's my work. Oh, no kidding! Lowry's a friend of mine, I work for him. Good dude. I mean, terrible person, but I feel like if I got to know him better, it'd turn out he has a heart of gold. That's the vibe I get from him anyway. Okay, yeah, yeah, so so we're cool. Can I cut a deal with you? Nah, I only told you that because I'm going to kill you. Besides, Lowry would be furious if he found that I dropped his name and made him, you know, like, party to the whole situation. <laughs> Dang it, Paul. Oh my god. Look, I GM enough, I, I know how it is. Now we're all going to be working together. Cheesley bolts for the ledge, then repels his way down the corner of the building at speeds you're positive that you can't follow. This looks like nature to Cheesley. He guns for a subway tunnel, and soon you've lost sight of him. You're pretty sure he got away. Dang. Should have gone for that replacement set he offered. And you get a phone call from Elvis. Hey, Paul. I took care of the camera problem. No issues. Smooth as butter. You know me. Uh, so how'd it go on your end? Oh, yeah. 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 Smooth over here, too. No complications. Expertly lost the trail. And, uh, we need to get in touch with Lowry. So now I'm in it, Paul. Now you're in it. To be honest, I don't know for sure what I'm gonna do with you since my current plans involve a lot of espionage, but you're a good face. The ability to just not be seen is really handy for not asking permission. But it's Lowry's business rival, so good jamming on that, Mason. I think they've stolen something from all of us now. They have. And you also know that you probably can't just walk in because at least Cheesley can see you. We can still walk in. We just have to walk either a little softer or a little more violently than usual. Or both. Anyway, I meet up with Elvis and then I call Lowry. I put him on conference call. Hello, Paul. You better be calling me to offer me a discount on my next blood delivery. Actually, no, not even then. You shouldn't be calling me. I thought you said I could call you if I learned something important about your competition. 
well, I didn't put you on a job like that, so unless you're having dinner with the CEO of one of my multinational competitors, I don't really see that being relevant. Am I allowed to talk to you, Mr. Lowry? I don't even know you. Paul, why is your degenerate friend on the phone? How are things going with the beans and Tupperware account, Lowry? How dare you bring that up to me? I'll have you know that I failed to secure that account with a level of professionalism that only someone of my skill could muster. You wouldn't understand the complexity of my business. Well, I think I ran into a certain Mr. Cheesley Ratman tonight. He swung by my place for a bit of shopping, but her prices were too steep for him. He stole our VR headset! Yeah, I was being euphemistic. He stole our VR headset. Paul, are you stupid? First of all, Cheesley Ratman wouldn't be caught dead in a disgusting rat hole that you call a home. Second, why would he steal your VR headset? Third, the rich are prone to fits of eccentricity, and if he wanted to steal your headset, you should have just let him. Obviously, he was enjoying the thrill. Yeah, the thrill of the chase. Through the sewers, up a sheer building face, then back down again where he disappeared into the subway. What do you know about this Cheesley guy, Lowry? I know he buys up accounts at a loss, so he has to be working for someone. It's all about pass-through income, Paul. Cheesley could be anyone. You could do his job. It's basically theft, but in the financial sector. Would it happen to be bad if I happened to name drop you during a conversation with the guy at the same time I threatened to throw him off a building? Yes. All right, Lowry. Hypothetically, suppose I did that. Paul, your only job is to not be noticed. Tell me things that you notice and then get me fresh blood. That's actually jobs? Multiple? Who is that? Who dares second guess Lowry? Uh, th that's Elvis. It's my partner on the VTuber thing. Why is your VTuber partner here? Are we online? Are we streaming? I will kill you, Paul. Why are we on speakerphone? Well, he's also psychologically impossible to notice. So it's, it's better that we're aware that he's listening than not, I think. I hate working with your type of vampire. You are just the worst. Well, we're all striving to be your type of vampire, sir. You know, upper class. One of these days, I'm gonna own my own house with my own tire swing. Gross. Then it won't be cool to own houses anymore. It's fine. We'll do it on the down low. No one will know we did it. Look, Lowry, do you know where this guy's office is? Maybe we can start there and put a nail in this problem really quick. All right. Listen to me. You can't just go messing around with private equity firms. It's a very delicate political situation. One of the firm's partners might be a U.S. senator, and almost every important vampire is involved in at least one. I'll check into it, make sure we're not stepping on any serious toes. All right, call me back when you got the green light. I will. And you're gonna owe me for this, Paul. This was a serious lapse in your judgment. I hang up. So what now, Paul? Well, Elvis, let's go to Larry's place and listen in. I think you'll need the bus to get uptown. That's okay. I'll conveniently do other work until Paul and Elvis just happen to arrive. All right, the team logo spins in and out. And Paul and Elvis walk through the door just as Lowry wraps up a phone call. All right, listen. I don't care how many giraffes he says he can fit in his butthole. Tell him every harassment lawsuit we deal with costs us another 60 Ks. And if this keeps up, we're going to get a new HR manager. God, I hang up. Oh, man. Elvis, looks like we missed some really good office politics there. I've always wanted to see an office politics dumpster fire. I've heard cubicle work isn't as bad as it seems on TV, but with this face, I know I'd never pass the interview. All right, Cheesley, Ratman, and Associates. I get their number and then find their address. Call them up on the phone. You get an answer. Hello, Cheesley, Ratman, and Associates. Yes, hello. This is Lowry with Lowry and Lowry Services, LLC. Is Mr. Cheesley available? Sorry, sir, this is an after-hours number. Mr. Cheesley isn't in at the moment. If this is after hours, why do you have a person answering the phone? I think my wages get billed as a tax write-off for about a dozen different layers of the company, sir. Oh, of course. It's interesting that you know that. That checks out. Well, I don't suppose you can put me through to Mr. Cheesley anyway. Sorry, sir. No. But can I leave a message? It's fairly urgent. You see, I'm gonna find him, open his neck with a can opener, and then drink his blood. Oh. Are you one of our clients? Because they said if we get these kinds of calls from a client, I should contact our lawyer. No, you idiot. I just told you I'm with a rival firm. Lowry and Lowry Services, LLC. I am going to kill your boss. Have him call me back. Oh. They said if we get these kinds of calls from another private equity firm, I should fax you a photocopy of Mr. Cheesley's naked bottom. That... that's sexual harassment. You and I could both sue Cheesley for sexual harassment. We'll both get about 50 Ks out of it. Really? Yeah, but first you gotta fax that over here. Uh, here, my fax number is 555 that's... that's too many numbers, sir. No, it isn't. It's eight digits. I see you haven't been in private equity very long, kid. Go ahead, I'm waiting for the facts. Okay. In a few minutes, you receive a terms of service exempting Cheesley from any lawsuit, which you agree to by seeing the top part of it, followed by a picture of Cheesley's butt. Curse the modern day. 
Sorry, kid. Cheesley got us. Looks like we won't get our lawsuit after all. Aw, uh, really? Hang up. Call Paul. Hello? Ah, what are you doing in my apartment? I told you to knock, and not to be noticed by me when you come in. I did both those things, Lowry. You successfully didn't notice. Oh. Good job, then, I guess. I, I didn't notice you knocking. Anyway, diplomacy didn't work right away, and I'm concerned that doing more diplomacy might give them a choice in the matter, so I'm going to send you and your friend to take care of things. All right, boss. What do you want us to do? Well, obviously, we have to kill Cheesley. He told me he was working for someone else. Yeah, that's normal. Private equity is just a giant shell game. He could be with anyone. Yeah, so your name might come up with the higher power is what I'm getting at. See, Paul, this is why I ask you to wait and listen and why I don't deploy you to talk to people. If we climb this ladder high enough, sooner or later we're going to be messing with the U.S. president's finances and then we're going to be enemies of the state. They just stole a VR headset, man. I'm sure this doesn't go all the way to the president. What if we just go to their place and steal their computer hard drives? Uh, God, I hate working with you people. Can't you be polite enough to exist in my mental space while we're planning something important? I am now. Anyway, I guess you can steal a few computer hard drives and we can see what's on them. All right, it's decided. I'll stay nearby in case it all goes poorly and someone needs to talk to the police. I have my cell. In fact, leave your cell phones on. You got it, and we'll get to it. Mason, I guess we head down to Cheesley's office. Wait, Paul, can he see us? Well, Elvis, we know Cheesley's not there. And unless the secretary that answers the phone is supernatural somehow, we should be able to just walk right in. All right, you all head down to Cheesley's office. How do you get there? I'll drive. I have a nice car. Perfect. You pull up in one of those sweet midlife crisis convertibles, even though you're probably way beyond midlife. The lights in the office are all turned off. Wait, Elvis, I got it. We could hire a driver. Then we don't need a driver's license and we don't need to get our photos taken. Oh my god, Paul. Don't just exclaim like that. I thought this was about the job. Right. Yes, the job. Don't worry, I'll remember that driver's thing. You and me. Soon we're gonna own a tire swing. And a house adjacent to it. That tire swing is gonna be freaking rad. It's gonna have LED lights and everything. Mason, we check the front door on the office. Okay, it's kind of a split office space with two separate buildings on either side of a hallway, and it's two stories tall. You come up to the door that you're looking for, open it up, and just sitting in there in total darkness is some wide-eyed, creepy-looking kid. He's got eyes like dinner plates, but he looks right at you and says, Oh, uh, welcome to Cheesley Ratman and Associates. We're closed right now. Oh. Yeah, uh, we, uh... We're the cleaning crew? Really? What happened to Bonzo? Well, it's the craziest thing. Bonzo died. Yeah. Super sucks. I love that guy. Oh. Yeah. He was really nice. What happened? He overdosed on opiates. See, he twisted his ankle and then got all messed up on pain pills. Then, just, you know. Yeah, we all saw it coming. I've been thinking a lot about the funeral. You know, what am I gonna do? In I think his family said they're going to try and keep it small, so they're not going to invite work friends. I guess it makes sense it's not getting around. Oh, yeah, okay, that makes sense. Yeah, so, so it's just, uh... Shame about his daughter, though. He had a daughter? Yeah, three years old. He never mentioned that. I thought it was forbidden. It is very forbidden. That's why he never talked about her, Elvis, and why we shouldn't gossip like this. You know, the daughter's just a rumor. Listen, kid, please don't tell anyone about Bonzo's daughter, Okay. The man just died, and I don't think his wife is ready to hear about it. Uh, about the daughter they presumably had together? Well, he doesn't. She doesn't want to know that the daughter's forbidden. The many layers of secrets that we we can't we just can't reveal those to people. Do you know that? that do you know that antelope men rule the world? They're from Lemuria, kid. Pa, pa. Everything you know is a lie. Your brain lies to you every day. Ninety percent of what you see is just a generalized picture that you don't even think about. A vampire could walk right by you in full Dracula cape and everything, and your brain might not even notice. Pa. Mason, I have the ability to make people I'm talking to feel very emotional. Okay, uh, then th this guy sitting here in the dark just listening to you rant starts feeling really taken in by all this. Really? You think they'd lie to me like this? The better question is when have they ever told the truth? Oh my god, you're right. When have they told the truth? I haven't thought of it from that angle. Can I really verify anything in my life? Oh, oh my god, I'm having a panic attack. That's normal. That's... That's perfectly normal to realizing that the perspective that people don't even want you to have. Look, kid, your eyes are open now. Don't look away. Don't blink. Just keep on staring until your eyes start to burn. It burns like a nasty venereal disease in a time before you could get antibiotics. Do you know what those times were like? No, no, I don't, sir. They were horrible, kid, but also free. Free like a bird. 
You never knew if you'd live or die, but you couldn't tweet about it on Facebook. Yeah, and it's a really big deal that society is a lie, but anyway, we have to go and clean the place. Oh, yeah, 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 right, right, yeah. Yeah, okay. Wait, you guys don't have cleaning equipment? Did uh, Bonzo not leave his here? He said that he may have left them somewhere. Oh, I hope not. I mean, you guys are supposed to be a third-party cleaning crew, so you're not supposed to leave your stuff here. Ah, man, Elvis, we forgot our cleaning stuff. Shoot, we were so wrapped up in reality that we forgot the cleaning stuff. Yeah, ah, uh, ah, uh, dang. All right, well, let's go get it before we forget again. All right, see you. We'll see you in a little bit, kid. Really sorry about the news about Bonzo. Yeah, me too. Me too. Today's been a ride. Uh, okay, bye. Dang it, Elvis, we're so stupid. He could see us. We didn't have a plan for if he could see us. We probably should have thought of one. Go back to the car. Lowry, we gotta go to the hardware store. What? Why? We need tools, Lowry. We're burglars. Sometimes burglars use tools. Elvis has an entire pack of locksmith's tools. What do you need? An industrial vacuum. You need an industrial vacuum to quietly break into this building. So far, yes. Look, Lowry, I don't question your profession. Do you know what a Stoffel wrench is? I have no idea what a Stoffel wrench is. Well, we don't have time to get into technical details as to why we need a shop vacuum. It would take hours to explain. We just need you to take us to the hardware store. That's all that we need. Okay, fine. I start up the engine and I drive these guys to the hardware store. There's one nearby. It only takes you about ten minutes. All right, so you're going to break into this place and steal an industrial vacuum. Do you need a Stoffel wrench to pick the locks, too? No, no, no way, Lowry. I got, like, two or three Stoffel wrenches. You can never have too many of those. Uh, but hey, when I open this first door, I bet the alarm's probably going to sound, so someone needs to get a brick ready to throw through the second door. After that, we're going to run in, grab that vacuum, and then get out before the cops get here. Ah, forget the brick. I'll just run right through with my vampire strength. You always say you'll do that, but if you throw the brick first, it'll weaken the window by putting a big hole in it, Paul. No way, Elvis. A plan with too many steps can fail at any of those steps. Better stick to just me running through the window. Okay, well, I'm about to get this lock. Lowry, maybe do you want to throw a brick? What am I? Some kind of barbarian? I already feel dirty just being the driver. I should have made Frank drive. I could have sat in the passenger seat and criticized his driving. Actually, I'm going to call Frank. You guys hurry this up. Okay, pop the trunk, please. Paul, get ready. Five, four, three, two, one. I run through the glass door. It isn't pleasant, and you're probably going to bruise a little, but you smash through. You guys then rush in, find a vacuum, presumably hiding your faces somehow, toss that vacuum in the trunk, and then get out before the police arrive. Yeah, yeah, great job, team. High fives all around. No. I'll give you one. No one deserves high fives until we accomplish what we actually came out to do. Fine. If you absolutely must know, we had to get the shop back because the receptionist could see us, and now he thinks we're cleaners. Can I get a high five for this genius ruse or what? What? No, no, you cannot have a high five. I have the power to convince people of almost anything by speaking to them directly. I could have just told them you were allowed in the building. We didn't need to steal this vacuum. Well, I don't need your powers. I'm doing it myself. Okay, that that's exactly... There's no high fives for this. I cannot permit a high five. In fact, I'm going to remember this. The next time you do deserve one, you're in the hole. I'm withholding a high five for the future. Ah, uh, that's not fair. It's so fair. Park the car. Get out. I'm going in this time. We're getting inside that place because, so help me, we are the kings of the night. And not all of us are sewer-dwelling simpletons who have to steal vacuums to maintain our cover stories. Get the vacuum. We don't need the vacuum. We might need the vacuum. Yeah, we went through all the trouble. We might as well have it. I don't care. I'm just whatever. If you don't care, then we'll bring it in. I barge into the office. Hello. Our office is closed right now. I'm with these idiots. I gesture to Paul and Elvis. We hold up the vacuum. Listen, we are going to clean this building. You will let us through that door. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, well, I guess go right in. Thank you. Man, that's lame. Why do your powers work, but not ours? Because I am not a sewer creature. You walk through the door to find an overly large office. Sitting in the dark on the only desk are two men in security outfits whose heads swivel towards you unnervingly. Their enormous eyes are glowing in the darkness. Yes, hello. Did you know you're sitting in the most filthy office in the entire planet? They exchange glances. Well, you are. I've seen a lot of offices, but this one is pretty gross. Here, get up. The guards get up. Run my finger along the desk. Look, you see all this dust? And what are the two of you doing on your payroll? Just sitting here like a couple of lumps? What, 
browsing your phones, probably. You wouldn't need to hire cleaners if either of you used your time efficiently. Let me guess, though, not in your job description. Speaking of Paul and Elvis, why aren't you doing your jobs? I guess plug in the vacuum and start vacuuming. I, uh, I pose next to the vacuum, trying to look essential to this process. Go to the computer and just open it up. Oh my god. Elvis, turn off the vacuum. I'm trying to speak. I turn off the vacuum. Wave the guards over. Do you see this? Everyone knows that dust accumulates inside these computers. If you don't clean them properly every now and then, the dust starts to settle. Do you want to put your finger on this? The guards shake their heads no. Yeah, I didn't think so. It's disgusting, isn't it? This is going to be like a whole job by itself. Elvis, come here. Bring your screwdrivers. Make some space in this thing to get our hands in there. I pull out the screwdrivers and remove the hard drive. And I guess also the GPU while I'm at it. Those are pretty expensive. I try to dust the desk. Take the hard drive from Elvis and hold it up towards the guards. Have you ever seen inside one of these things when they haven't been cleaned properly? They kind of look nervously at each other and then shake their heads. It's recommended that you clean one of these at least twice a week with one of those little air canisters. But once the dust starts to settle, you develop a massive problem. These things start growing mold, and it looks like a radioactive wasteland inside. Slap the desk angrily. A few minutes of your time is all it would take. Now I have to put this thing in a special machine that won't damage the software. Ah, oh, God. Put the drive in my pocket. All right, Elvis, run the vacuum in there and then close it up. I guess I put the shop vac hose in the computer case and just start sucking stuff up. Once it feels right, I close up the computer and start to head out the door. Okay, there's still a lot more work to be done here, and I'm going to bill your boss for what I've already done. But I have to talk to him about the size of this invoice before I do any more because he's in for some real sticker shock. Slam the door behind me, glare at the receptionist, then storm out. See you around, kid. Okay. See ya. See? What would you have done if you walked in there with your vacuum cleaner and those guards questioned you? Lied to them? Probably make up more backstory for Bonzo. Who is Bonzo? We have no idea. But he died recently. It's tragic. He had a secret child. Shut up, you idiots. Let's get back to my place so I can look at the contents of this hard drive. And throw that vacuum in the dumpster. But, Lowry, free vacuum. I don't need a vacuum. I hire people for cleaning. Lowry, if we've learned anything today... That is apparently a massive security risk. Paul, do not test me. I will stuff you in that vacuum if you don't throw it away. Fine. Waste of a good vacuum, though. You guys hop in the car and drive back to Lowry's place. When you arrive, Frank is gone. Because you called him earlier and I think you were going to make him drive. Oh, right. Oh well, Frank needs to get out more. I plug this hard drive into my computer. Whoa, whoa, what if you got a virus on there? You don't know what kinds of websites that hard drive has been on. Are you a computer expert, Paul? I kinda am. Well, am I gonna get a virus? Eh. Very reassuring. I turn the computer on. You turn on the computer, start clicking around through files, and you shortly realize you have no idea what you're looking for or looking at. There is a ton of data, but it fundamentally all has to do with hiding where everything came from. Almost as though someone made it intentionally opaque in case someone tried to do an audit on this company. Ah, oh, no. I don't suppose anyone here is an expert in bureaucracy. Are you not? All of my operations are legal, asterisk, or on the bleeding edge of legal. I have people for the bureaucratic stuff, and also a bunch of shell companies who do this kind of thing beneath me, and for good legal reasons I have no idea how it works. All right then, well let's get one of your lower people. I just said that my operations are legal, asterisk. You think I want to get that involved with the stolen hard drive and what's going to look like a corporate espionage case, because partly it is? I'm totally going to get back the beans and Tupperware account. But we can't sort through all of this ourselves. We don't have the time. Or the patience. Let's hunt down Cheesley and torture him. Actually, we might not need to. I know a guy who doesn't work for the company. He's the world's most premier expert in bureaucracy. We're not exactly on good terms, but I think he might be a good shot. I'm not really sure if Flowery's powers worked on those security guards. That was some natural psychology stuff. You walk into a room carrying a bunch of equipment and everyone thinks you belong there. It would have worked even better if we'd been wearing reflective safety vests. Man, Elvis, I know we both wanted to play sneaky sewer guys, and I have no regrets, but the whole invisibility thing is so binary. Either they can see you or they can't, and you don't have a lot of options in the first situation. At least with the failed persuasion ability, you can play it off, assuming you're smooth about it, which you should be if you're a social character. 
Those guards are still gonna be furious when they realize they've been tricked, Lowry. And we all gave them our names. I'm glad we did. I want them to know who's messing with them. But we really ought to prepare for that since now they know where we live. Nah, we'll be fine. What are they gonna do? Kill Frank? I'll hire another talented bartender. They must grow like weeds in the city, right? What are you worried about, Paul? They're just security guards. What attachment could they possibly have to anything bigger than that? They were two guards sitting in a pitch black room who could see a couple of invisible vampires, and they didn't even comment on our natural dark vision, as though it was just expected of someone who works there. I'm fairly sure those are not regular employees, Mason. How hard is it to just lay low when all your stuff's already in the sewers, Paul? Hey, that's not fair. I've got plenty of stuff they could trash. I've got a sleeping bag and a computer down there. Well, anyway, I've got a lead on someone who can help us unravel the mystery of the private equity shell company. His name is Derek Pecuniaman. He used to work on the inside of the system, but one day he made the foolish mistake of blowing the whistle on a firm for a billion-dollar tax evasion scheme. He lost everything. Why do you even blow the whistle? The IRS offers a reward to whistleblowers as a percent of what they can recover from the tax dodger. If you were a fool, you'd think, oh, a percent of billions of dollars is a lot of money. But the trick is the IRS has to actually find that money. And guess what they didn't do? They didn't find the money. They didn't even open the case. They're so understaffed and we have such a ridiculous tax code that it would have taken all hands on deck. So the IRS instantly gave up and handed Pecuniaman over to his firm without so much as a thank you. After that, Pecuniaman's wife left him. He lost the house, he lost his car, and he can't find work. One of the world's greatest financial geniuses and experts. Now just a lowly tax preparer for hire. Oh, we're rich now because of the V-tubing. You think he'd prepare our taxes? I just said he's a desperate man, Elvis. So, yes? Yes, he'd do your taxes. But for an appropriate price, I'm sure he'd be comfortable taking another swing at the financial wasp nest and tell us who owns Ratman. All right, let's go see the guy. But before we do, we need to stop off at a gas station. Why? Paul, maybe now's a good time to kick your habit. We're going to be riding in a nice car. What are you going to do in my car? I'm not going to do anything to your car. You always tell me not to ask questions. Why is it okay for you to ask questions? Because I don't do weird things in my car. It hurts me seeing you like this, Paul. If we're gonna see someone important, I gotta get my fix, Elvis. Get off my back! No one is getting in my car if you're gonna do something weird. Look, let's take Frank's car. Why do we need to go to the gas station? Look, man, do you want to maintain this aloofness where we don't really know anything about each other? I... I think we should all let down our barriers personally. Mr. Lowry, what are your hobbies? Minor V-tubing, which is also my job, and Pac-Man. One day I hope to beat Pac-Man. Okay, no, I refuse. We'll take Frank's car... Nobody will talk to me. I sit in the front, you sit in the back. My hobbies include endlessly researching debunked conspiracy theories. Obviously, no one would have debunked them if they didn't contain some kernel of truth. And I intend to find that truth. Shut up. Shut up. I call Frank. You call Frank, who's confused because you're not at the place you said you'd be, but he agrees to come home and drive you guys somewhere else. Not too long afterward, you're all in Frank's car. He pulls over at the gas station. Get out. Go outside. Drink straight out of the cherry slurpee nozzle. Go vomit in the bathroom. Do we need to go in? No, he just needs to do his thing. We can wait here. It's... it's no problem. Come back out with a 40 ounce of red Slurpee. What is that? It's like, uh... cold. Sugar. And water. It's pretty great. I mean, I mean, not great like blood. Or like a food that you could keep down, and it's cold coming up. And to be honest, all my justification for this is terribly weak, but I have never let that hold me back before. You want some? Ugh, it makes me sick just smelling it. Suit yourself. I'd say it's your loss, but I can't hold it in, really, so no one can have it. That's what makes it so appealing. No one can get away with ramming their head into a wood chipper, but that doesn't make that appealing. How do you know if you never tried? Just keep your carnival drink to yourself. So guys, you're vampires and it's the dead of night. How are you getting in touch with this auditor that Lowry knows? Oh, uh, yeah. I keep forgetting that vampires don't do daytime. If I'd remembered that either, I wouldn't have made everyone get in the car. I should have scheduled an evening cocktail or something. It's not too late. We could skip to the next evening. No, I already got everyone in the car. And Paul has his barf drink. If I change my mind now, I'll just look foolish. Okay, so are you just going to drive to his house while he's sleeping? Yeah. Frank, drive us down to the poor person zone. Which zone is that, Lowry? You say they're all the poor person zone. Obviously the one where Pecuniaman lives. Why do I have to spell this out, Frank? You're right, yeah, I got the address. I'll just have to double check. Uh, uh, pull over, I'm gonna throw up. Some driving and numerous pit stops later, you guys are outside the city approaching a dilapidated suburb. 
You know the income's not good when there's no gutters and the retaining walls have sagged over so they're not retaining anything. Is that how you keep a lookout for a bad neighborhood? I always heard you're supposed to keep an eye out for a street that's lined with payday loans and liquor stores. Poor neighborhoods have crumbling infrastructure, bad neighborhoods are littered with pawn shops, payday loans, and liquor stores, and there's some overlap between those two. This area here is a poor area, but not really a bad area. It's like light residential poverty. It's a different kind of desperation. Anyway, Pecuniaman has a little one-story home, one-car garage, gravel driveway, hedges that aren't being taken care of, and there's a dog in the yard, but it's probably not his. Why, hello there, friend. Are you lost or otherwise unattended? The dog comes up to you, tail wagging like it's known you for years. Cool, free dog. I pick him up. Can I pick him up? What kind of dog is it? Like a medium-sized mixed breed. He's kind of furry, sharp, perky ears. Kind of struggles to get down after you pick him up. He's probably got fleas, ticks, and worms, Elvis. You can't just be friends with a stray dog. You gotta provide an offering first. Mason, I let the dog drink the rest of my Slurpee. All right, the dog calms down and starts drinking your Slurpee. Yeah, I get ya. Just drink all that until you barf. We think alike, me and you. At least I'm not the only one who sees the resemblance. At least dogs are happy animals, Lowry. Me and Elvis are happy animals. Are we, though? Well, you're happy anyway. I know. But I worry about you, Paul. I'm happy? Who says I'm not happy? How come no one's worried about my happiness? You say you're not happy all the time. It's the number one most common thing you say anytime I come back with any kind of information. That's because all of your information makes me unhappy. I think you have a confirmation bias where your job leads to my anger, so you think that's how I am all the time. Well, what makes you happy, Lowry? I enjoy playing golf with my business friends, Paul. But Lowry, you can't play golf. We're vampires. We can only come out at night. Well, I play at night with other vampires. I bet you didn't think of that, did you, Elvis? Also, there's indoor golf. Like cosmic mini golf? Yes. Open at the mall until 10, okay? Kids under three get to putt for free. I guess maybe I am being a bit unfair to you, Lowry. Cosmic mini golf combines anger and fun into a single friendship-ruining bundle. I can see where that appeals to you. I get so mad, but I have a wonderful time and I'm very happy. See, isn't it nice discussing our hobbies? No. Let's focus on the task at hand. A powerful bureaucratic wizard lives inside that house, and we need him to look at a bunch of illegally obtained business information. So are we going to go black bag him, or are you just going to tell him to help us? I guess we could do both. I vote both. That way everyone gets to feel useful. Okay, fine. You guys go in and open the window, then I'll climb in and tell this guy we need his help. Now that's a good vampire story. We're good vampires. All right, Elvis, hit the door. Mason, I pick the lock. You set the dog down to get your tools, and the dog runs off. Then you pick the lock and walk on into a neat-looking living room. It appears the place gets vacuumed pretty regularly. He's got one of those big plasma TVs on a stand in the living room. The furniture itself is all bargain bin affordable stuff. There's a small kitchen to your left, and down the hall are doors to the garage, the bathroom, and the bedroom. Aw, I lost my dog. Oh well, I guess we wander on down to the bedroom. Okay, you let yourselves in, and you find an office-bedroom hybrid. On the walls are all kinds of corporate rewards and photos from the company that fired Pecuniaman after he reported on them. Aw, what a sad dude. I unlock his window and wait for Lowry to come in. I climb in. You are not so stealthy. You climb right in as cheery as you please, and Pecuniaman shoots up in bed. What? Who the heck are you? Pecuniaman? I'm Lowry with Lowry Services, LLC, and I have an amazing business proposition for you. What are you doing in my house? Can a man as wealthy as me not break into another man's home when he has an amazing business opportunity? Pecuniaman stops to think about it. Well, that depends. Exactly how wealthy are you? Well, I've got eight figures in liquid assets, and I have no idea how much or what is tied up in all the theoretical business partners operating below me. Ah, uh, eight figures is only just barely enough to justify breaking into someone's home. Everyone knows you guys are just a bunch of wannabes. Well, it's enough to buy this land from your landlord, making me your new landlord, and then I can just let myself in whenever I want. Chokes on you! I am the landlord! During the holiday season, I stay in a month-to-month -month lease apartment and then rent this place out through Airbnb. The margins on that doesn't sound amazing. This is kind of a rundown area. I stay in an even worse area, with bars on the windows and on the door. I make a killing. All right, that checks out. Here's my car. Put on your shoes. We're going to Cosmic Mini Golf at the mall. Ah, oh, heck. Now I know that's serious. Let me put on my good suit. I've been out for something important enough for Cosmic Mini Golf in years. He puts on a nice suit, seems to be fitted, and looks good on him. The guy hasn't apparently lost sight of the priority of looking good during a meeting. 
That's good. I'm glad you haven't forgotten the act. I'd hate to go cosmic golfing and then be mistaken for anything but a serious businessman. Not a problem, he says. He goes outside, everyone piles in the car, he gets in his, and you all go down to the mall to play a round of cosmic golf. Business style. Hey, Lowry, are me and Paul going to get to play cosmic golf too? Are you guys important business people? I don't think you know the etiquette. I know the etiquette. Wait for the people ahead of you. If the ball goes off course, that counts as two strokes. And if you're golfing versus a pregnant lady, she counts for half because she's golfing for two. All right, shut up. You obviously don't know the proper rules for golfing for business. Just let me do all the talking. I'm good at it. You guys are good at standing in the corner and looking the opposite of pretty. You guys get to the mall. Go inside and find the Cosmic Golf Building. You rent a pair of putters and golf balls and start your very adult, serious business meeting. Mason, I do everything I can to secretly mess up all Larry's shots. That's funny. For a guy who supposedly does a lot of these golf outings, you're not very good. Look, I'm just getting warmed up, okay? Sometimes the golf ball is cursed. It happens. Kind of like it happens to someone's career. Yep, it sure does. He scores a perfect hole in one. Goes right in the hippo's nose, comes out the tail, and sinks it in. The whole financial world knows about you, Pecunuman, but nobody will touch you. Even a glance in your direction is a death sentence. Yeah? If that's so, why risk coming out in public to this dark, blacklight-lit den of corporate dealings? Someone you know might be out on the course today. A little foolish for someone who knows about old Pecuniaman. Well, look, Pecuniaman, there's something I need you to do. And it's not on the up and up, but I know you're a beggar and can't be choosy. Okay, so I got busted for blowing the whistle on an illegal enterprise, and now I can't get hired because everyone's a crook, and you thought the best person to come to with your illegal enterprise was me. Okay, now that you say it out loud, you are a whistleblower. This does sound really dumb. I pick up my ball and I start to walk off. Uh, uh, wait, now, wait, wait. Uh, just because it's dumb doesn't mean I don't want to hear it out. If I learn anything from whistleblowing, it's that the foxes run the chicken coop. What do you want, sir? All right. I got a hard drive from one of my competitors, and I need to find out where a certain Beans and Tupperware account went to. Who made the profit? Who calls the shots? Hey, Lowry, it occurs to me maybe the guy above Cheesley in the business sense isn't the guy who gave the word to steal our VR set. That's idiotic. Who else would be in charge? What's idiotic? Oh, sorry. I was thinking out loud. Look, this is gonna sound idiotic, but if you see someone else on that hard drive making orders besides the criminal organization that owns this guy's business... Let me know, okay? Now, wait a minute. I didn't say I was going to take the job. Okay. Look him in the eyes. But you have to. And why is that? Because I'm... Maybe you can't see in this light, but I'm making a really compelling look with my eyes. Can you see it? Larry, you're talking to one of the most premier experts in finance. He doesn't understand how to be charmed by a vampire. The only thing he finds charming is money and math. Okay, I'm trying to imply that I can make things happen for you. Maybe. What do you want? Well, I never know I'm never going to get back in the business world, but there is one thing that's been driving me crazy. When I lost my job, I was reduced to nothing. I mean, really, nothing. I had to get a job delivering pizzas from a place that put illegal drugs in the box. It was called Huron in Pizza. Do you want me to get back at the pizza place? Now, what I want is nothing but a bottle of wine. Well... I could throw in the pizza thing as a side deal. I don't mind. Okay. Now you screwed up my dramatic reveal. You have to say, a bottle of wine? That sounds too easy. If it's going to be complicated, I'd rather just burn down your pizza place. Uh, okay. You say you want to work with me, but you're not working with me. Say, it sounds too easy. No, now it sounds like it's going to be hard. It's not that hard. I, I just can't segue into the next part if you don't work with me. Well... Say it's not as hard as you make it sound, and then tell me what it is, because it, now it sounds like it's going to be really hard. Okay, it's not as hard as I make it sound now. I just want to get a specific bottle for my wife. You see, when I lost my prospects for a high-paying job, my wife left me for a better offer at a higher-paying husband. And when she left, she took it all. The dog, the cars, the houses, everything. The equity firm backed her up, gave her the best lawyers. But there's one thing she took that had purely sentimental value. A bottle of fine wine from a friend who passed away a few years after the wedding. One day I'd hope to pop that bottle open in celebration of something turning out really great. But she took it. And now I'll never get that chance. Get it back and I'll do anything. Okay. Can you give me her address? And also the address of the pizza place you used to work at. You don't have to do the pizza place. But I want to though. For you, I want us to be friends. I'll make it look like an accident. 
Okay, fine. Here's both addresses. All right, I'm going to do this tonight, Pecunioman. I turn heel and I leave. Go back to the car. All right, Frank, I assume our ugly friends are in the car. Take us to the address of this pizza place. Lowry, you didn't even finish your golf game. That was very rude. I would have played the rest of the holes. I told you, you're not business savvy enough. Leaving in the middle of a game is a power move. Frank drives you on down to the pizza place. It's in the bad part of town, with bars over the windows and a payday loan on every corner. It's late enough the place is closed. The lights on the signage are mostly busted out. All right, you guys do your thing. Make this place disappear. You got it, boss. I slam the car door. Make this place disappear? Who does he think we are? Houdini? I don't suppose you brought a giant sheet to throw over this place. Maybe it's got a gas line or something. We can give it a look. I guess open her up, Elvis. I bust out my tools and bust this place open. In you go, into one of the filthiest pizza parlors you've seen in a long time. All the chairs are stacked up, but it doesn't look like the tables have been wiped down. There's a faint smell of anchovies and a few crumpled up napkins on the floor. If you're looking for the basement where the gas stuff might be found, there's a door by the cash register. It's locked too, but you jimmy it right open in no time. Was there anything you wanted to know about the top side before you head on down? Grab a crushed red pepper shaker. This'll go great with my next Slurpee. You have a terrible problem, Paul. Oh, come on, don't tell me you never wondered if adding some spice to your blood would give it more kick. You'd be messing with the perfect recipe. It's just blood. Pure blood. Perfection. Lowry had stuff to his, so I'm not the only one who thinks it could stand to gain some variety. Lowry has a mental problem, too. Anyway, let's go check out the basement. You head down in the basement and find it's full of chemistry equipment, presumably for making drugs. There's a clothesline and some greasy-looking dude with a patchy beard sleeping noisily on a cot. Okay. So our job is to destroy this entire building and also kill this dear, sweet, innocent lamb laying before us. Yeah, I mean, maybe this guy was fun in his younger years, but once you start pushing a major drug problem into your 40s, it stops being a party and starts being... Well, it's a drug problem. So how do we destroy an entire building? Paul, do you know what a gas line looks like? No, I don't really know what a gas line looks like. We live in a storm sewer. We don't get natural gas down there. I'd make a joke about poo gas, but composite sewer lines haven't been a thing for decades. Well, Lowry wants us to blow up the building. How are we supposed to blow it up if we don't know what we're doing? I have no idea. That's the thing about not knowing what you're doing. See, I hate this. Other vampires think that just because our clan can be invisible, we make great assassins. Well, guess what? That type of thing takes training. You know what kind of training we get down in the sewer? We learn to listen really carefully for rushing water. That, and we also get no formal training in assassinating people. No one comes down in the sewer. That's the point of the sewer. We avoid people. We're good at avoiding people. Okay, but if we told him that we couldn't do it and we avoided people successfully, he's just going to whine so much. Look, there's a drug lab. Maybe, like, maybe those, those explode sometimes, right? Do you know what chemistry makes them explode? I'm really more of a breaking and entering guy. I know about locks. All right, well, look around for a water heater. I hear if you mess with those, they can explode. And it is very dangerous. You should never tamper with them. Well, is it going to explode if we tamper with it on purpose? I'm just going to turn all the knobs all the way up. There's probably safety ratings that don't allow them to explode immediately just by turning up the knobs. But then it's not exploded. It might explode eventually. I mean, if we just, like play with the knobs, an explosion might happen, and then we can tell Lowry that we tried. In fact, actually, let's just lie to him and pretend that we did a competent job. None of this matters anyway. Okay, so do you guys just go back to the car? I guess. But first I find the water heater and turn the heat all the way up to max temperature. I don't think it'll explode from that, but it'll burn this guy's employees. Then maybe he'll get sued or something, I don't know. None of them can probably afford lawyers, but no problem. You find the water heater, turn the heat all the way up to maximum, then go find Lowry waiting in the car with Frank. All right, boss, no problem. We opened up a gas line and then exposed one of the wires connecting to the light switch. When that guy wakes up and turns on the light, boom! No more pizza place. God, I really want Pecunia men to know we're not screwing around. Isn't blowing this place up kind of screwing around? Because no one's getting anything out of it. We're instilling fear into Pecunia men so he knows we're willing to kill to get what we want. But what do we want from the pizza place? You know that saying that if you make peaceful protest impossible, violence is the only option? That's stability, Lowry. You need to establish rules for people. If we blow stuff up randomly, what kind of rule does that establish? Bikuniman is just going to think that we're crazy. He won't know what we're going to do. Excuse me. Do you run a very important business that specializes in doing arbitrary and crazy things to hide money? No. 
I don't think you do, because if you did, everyone would run screaming from you because you're a horrible, disgusting freak. Now quit being visible to me and get back in the car. I turned invisible to Lowry, then turned to Paul. Okay, do you see that? Did you see? See? Peaceful protest is completely shut down. We need to blow up Lowry's apartment. We need to learn to blow things up, and then we need to blow up his things. This is why I don't usually bring you along for Lowry's jobs, Elvis. We don't even need the money anymore. We are giant boobs fake girls on the internet, and we are rolling in money. But who knows how long it'll last. Besides, I'm fond of the dumpster fire that's Lowry's work assignments. The man has a complex, and that leads to complex jobs. I'd like to be mentally stimulated, Elvis. I can't get that by pretending to be an anime girl all the time. Sometimes I gotta go out and lie about blowing up buildings. You could lie to the viewers on stream. In fact, that's all that we're ever doing. How is that different? The difference is Lowry really thinks that we rigged this building to blow. There's nothing sweeter than tricking your friend into thinking that you committed arson. What about drinking blood? Why is it always blood with you? You can't just enjoy the lesser things in life. I do, but you just said the greatest pleasure, the sweetest thing, is, is this. I know as vampires you don't really feel that way. Drinking blood's our thing. Are you two in the car? Because we're about to leave. I'm driving off in 15 seconds. Hop in the car. Me too. So you guys head out of town and start driving into the country towards the address that you've been given. If one of you looks it up on Google Maps, you'll see it's one of those massive, rich person farmsteads that doesn't keep anything except thoroughbred horses. It's perched up on a hill through a deep woods and has a sort of castle motif with some Victorian-era flares. You pass by a super nice school, which probably teaches all of 10 or 20 kids. They have a horse stable and an archery range. Ah, oh, man, I bet they have the best field trips, too. If I ever had kids, I would want them to go there. We can't have kids. We're undead. And we may be making decent money now, but I think we need to run a multinational to get a house in this district. The road on the way up is windy and kind of ominous in the dark. But the trees are pretty. You hear a wolf howling in the distance as you roll up the private drive. Ah, oh, man, it's the perfect vampire house. We need to save up enough money to buy YouTube and then live here. They take half our income. How would we possibly buy YouTube? Besides, I haven't seen a single tire swing. This place isn't that fancy. Show me the good tire swings. You finally pull up to a gate, which is fairly close to the house. Is there a buzzer at the front? Yes, there is. Okay, my powers don't work through electronics like this. Looks like you two jokers are up. All right, we hop out of the car. You guys get out and gaze up at this Victoria-style McMansion. Lightning strikes in the distance. So gameplay-wise, what's the deal with Pecunium and Mason? Did you and Lowry coordinate? Yeah, Paul. Lowry wanted to know people who could do all kinds of shady financial stuff for him, and I said he could know a guy, and if he wanted a favor, he'd have to do something in return. Which then obligates you to come up with the whole storyline for Lowry's contact. Well, I wasn't going to ask for him and not use him, Paul. At first I was going to try and do a lot with vampire clan politics. Then I realized I wasn't going to be very good at that. I can't even remember the clan names. So instead I focus on the stuff that you guys said your characters were about. It's how I would have gone. I really would like more clan politics personally, Elvis. Yeah, but I don't remember the clan names either. Plus this way we're independent, you know? Anyway, you guys are just outside the gates of a castle-like mansion in the dead of night. There's wolves howling, lightning in the distance, and the patio furniture by the pool clashes with the drapes inside the house. It's ominous. Just truly ominous. Paul, I have a feeling that something truly evil lives here. Well, Elvis, it's a wealthy home, so by some people's utilitarian definition, this person is evil by default. There's no way they'll be able to independently justify all this wealth. Why, they could probably house a hundred homeless people, and yet I bet we won't find a single homeless guy in there. Except us, because we're homeless. I mean, if you don't consider the sewer to be a proper home. The city sure doesn't. But I mean, more like a dark supernatural force. Of which type? Well, I guess a vampire. Or a Scooby-Doo villain dressed as a vampire. It can't be a vampire. Vampires live in places like sewers and flats in the middle of the city. We would know, because we are one. And if there is a Scooby-Doo villain, that means he has to be a nefarious third party trying to drive down the property value of the house. Are the two of you gonna hop that fence and steal that bottle of wine or not? Yeah, of course. We're just planning the details of the heist. You're dealing with experts here, Lowry. All right, hop up on my shoulders and pull me up after you. Up. You guys pull yourself up and over the fence. The yard is nice but expensive, but the walk from the front door to the gate isn't too far. A couple of dogs come bounding out, but they seem confused. You know dogs can sort of sense you and tell that something's up by their instincts, but they can't find you directly. They start barking out of anxiety. 
You see a shadowy figure look out the window, but nobody turns the light on. Wave at them. The curtains close. Either they can't see us, or they're very rude. Or both. That's a pretty succinct observation. Really just covering all the possibility bases. For all we know, that was Bigfoot. Is Bigfoot the terrible evil that you sense in this house? He might be. He might be evil. I don't know Bigfoot. All right, well, let's try the front door. Is it locked? Taking the bold way forward. Yes, it is locked. Well, it doesn't have to stay locked. Do you want me to open it up? Uh, nah. Nah, a place like this is going to have electronic security. If we just bust in, we're going to trip the alarm. Let's try and case the joint first. Mason, are there any security cameras or anything outside that are going to spot us? To your surprise, no. Or at least you don't see any. I don't suppose there's like a separate wine cellar in the back or anything? The main house is a large building. There's a pool at the side of the mansion, and around back they've got a tiny little apple orchard with a garden path through it. The garden looks really well taken care of. Ah, uh, this is so pretty. It's no wonder that Pecuniman's wife left him for this. This is way better than where Pecuniman is living. And yet I don't see a single tire swing. You know what they say, Elvis. You can judge a man's personality based on the type of stuff he keeps in his yard. And I don't know what an apple tree says about a man because I've never known someone who had apple trees. You can't trust a guy you don't know anything about. I don't like it. Maybe it says he loves apples. Maybe. Or maybe it says he's a control freak who loves to control apples and control their growth and everything they do. You know, if you're going to be that liberal with the psychoanalysis, I guess your backyard really could say literally anything. Elvis, my abilities are vast and wide and complex and a curse and a gift. Hey Mason, is there like a garden shed with a ladder in it? There is. Next to the orchard is a shed with a variety of tools and a ladder. Okay, is there a balcony or an upper floor with like a door leading into the house? And if so, can this ladder reach it? Yeah, there's a balcony on the second floor that overlooks the orchard. You open up the ladder and it looks like it'll reach. Well, that doesn't exactly get around our electronic security problem, but it will at least get us in the house through a less expected route. And we know the door up there isn't going to have one of those modern doorbells with the camera in it. I guess so. Plus, we'll get a nice view of the orchard. Mason, we climb up the ladder. When we get to the top, I'll pull it out and fold it up so nobody sees it just propped up against the house. Sure. Pulling it up is kind of tricky, but with Paul's help, the two of you pull the ladder up behind you. We go in the house. Try and look for cameras on the way in. In you guys go. Lowry, what are you doing on the other side of the wall? Are you just parked out in front of the gates? I guess so. I'm probably playing a mobile game on my phone. In that case, a shadowy figure slides up next to the driver's side window. Of course, you can see in the dark, so once you get a good look at him, you see he's somewhat portly, he's bald, and he's got deep bags under his eyes, and he's got a pencil mustache. He's wearing a pinstripe suit. He doesn't knock or anything, he just stares intently through the window. Roll down the window. Excuse me, I'm in the middle of a very intense game of Angry Flappy Bird Temple Jewel. It's a little awkward with you watching over my shoulder. Could you please move, or at the very least get in the back seat and watch my screen from there so you're not in the periphery of my vision? I'm so sorry, sir. It's just that you're in our driveway in front of the house, and the dogs are barking madly. Are you here to see someone? Oh, not exactly. I'm actually an assessment agent from the city. You know... Just have to make sure you're still paying taxes on your property. It's the dead of night, sir. How can you even see the house? I have insomnia, and I'm an early riser anyway. I planned to stay here until the sun came up and someone came outside. But I guess since you're here, I can do the questions anyway. Mason, I fish out some spare paper and a pen from Frank's glove compartment. What's Frank doing? Frank is letting you do the talking. Would you want him to do any different? No, Frank's doing good being quiet. Okay, so can you tell me how many bedrooms and how many bathrooms you have in the home? Do you have a badge, sir? It's not like the police. You don't get a badge. We don't even go in the house. You tell me what's in the house, and then I write it down, okay? Now how many bedrooms and how many baths do you have? Six bedrooms, eight baths. Great. And do you have a finished basement? I assume that you do. Yes, a finished basement. Okay. Well, I still need to see the exterior, but that's not happening until morning. Can I ask you to go somewhere where the dogs will not bark so much? Ugh. How far away do I have to drive for the dogs to not bark at me? I believe if you head down the road, there is a gas station you can wait at. Fine. Get us out of here, Frank. I'll see you in the morning, sir. It's for the best, sir. Sometimes the wolves get travelers. You drive off, leaving the bald man in the suit standing alone there in the dark. Frank, how come you're not creepy and ominous like that guy? You want me to be? You could be. That guy had gravitas. Frank shrugs. Elvis and Paul, the two of you let yourselves into the house and find you're in a kind of library. There's a wooden floor and a lot of statues with a sort of old English church vibe. Tons of gargoyles and other carvings whose symbology is lost to time, 
probably making fun of someone the sculptor knew personally. Look for a closet. I want to put the ladder out of view. Uh, yeah. There's a sort of closet. It's full of boxes and the ladder fits in there. And no cameras? Still none, unless they're really well hidden. Pull out one of the books and see if there's a hidden passage. Like, just randomly, you just pull a book out? Yeah, I don't expect there to be one. It's like winning a lottery, you know, one in a million shot. Uh, sure. Paul, you walk up to the shelf, browsing through all these really old-looking tomes. A lot of them have Latin on the back and other old languages you don't read. And then you come across a brightly colored red book with no label on it, and it looks fresher than the other books. You grab it, pull it, and then the bookshelf next to it slides away to reveal a hidden passage! Well, I will be a monkey's uncle! Whoa! Where's it go? It's a short passage. You follow it down the line, slide away a panel at the end, and then you're in the hallway. A short way down the hall is the normal door that leaves the library, so it looks like this was just a fun way to exit the library, or maybe a good place to hide. Weird. We gotta remember this, though. I bet nobody would expect vampires to be hiding in the walls. Go back and put the book back so the entrance is hidden again. You rehide the passage, then go back to the hall where I assume you begin looking for stairs so you can go to a wine cellar, which is probably where they'd keep the wine. Sure thing. Yeah, so the hallway is full of those classical suits of armor you see in movies when people are wandering around an old house. And at one point you pass a painting of a stern-looking man wearing a tuxedo and a cape. At his foot is a large black hound. The man's hair is slicked back and he himself looks rather pale. The eyes in the painting are quite piercing, and what catches your attention is that they're following you as you walk down the hall. Walk up to the painting. Hey, excuse me, can you see me? Because I am getting sick and tired of being spotted by things. It is bad enough with the phones and the security cameras and every other modern ballyhoo messing up the only thing that I get out of this vampire shtick. I don't need it from paintings, too. As you're parading the painting, you notice the eyes are cut away and recessed into the painting a little bit to create the optical illusion of the eyes following you. Oh. It seems I was mistaken. I'm sorry for yelling at you. It's been a stressful day. One of the suits of armor lunges forward and grabs Elvis. Oh, no. Like a guy in a suit of armor? Yep. Clank. And he was standing right behind the portrait, so he's on you pretty quick. Dude, have you just been waiting here for who knows how long for exactly this kind of situation? Oh, yeah, he goes. Try and make it sound crazy now on the night all this waiting is finally justified. Now I'm finally going to give up hope. I've been standing here every day of my life wondering if I was ever going to catch someone, and now here someone is. No way, it's not crazy now, I'm not letting go. Struggle to break loose. You turn your vampire strength against this guy and find, oh no, he's also supernaturally strong. Paul, he's not mortal. All right, all right, you got us. But you know the weakness of that full suit of plate mail? Visibility. I take my shirt off and wrap it around that guy's head. Oh, hey, don't do that. I didn't train for this. Well, how about this? I jump on his back. He's got super strength so he can hold your weight and he doesn't let go of Elvis. Hey, what are you doing back there? Uh, a rich guy like you wouldn't know about street fighting, bud. Now all I need is for you to chase me outside so I can hit you with my truck. I go limp and sort of wriggle out. I try and pull on his arms to make it harder for him to hold on. With Paul's help, Elvis successfully drops to the floor like a noodle. The knight starts trying to grab at you, Paul. I also go limp and just fall right off of him. Come back here. He tears Paul's shirt off his face. Get up and run down the hall. Just a bit down the hall is a spiral flight of stairs. I leap down him. Down the first flight you go. Paul? Follow Elvis. Take a running, shirtless leap down the stairs. You follow behind. Clang, 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 clang. The knight gives chase. Hey, slow down. Don't jump. You're going to hurt yourselves. Jump down the next flight. You guys are on the ground floor now in the foyer. 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 It's a wide open space with a marble floor. Next to the door is a coat rack with a large black cape hanging on it. There's a maid running towards the stairs, but she runs right by you. Grab the cape, wrap it around my naked torso, and then run down a random hallway. Follow Paul. Clang, 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 clang. The knight rounds a corner. What's wrong? The maid asks. Invisibles, he yells. Invisibles have snuck into the house. I'll follow you, she says. You guys run through the door and find yourselves in the kitchen. Look for a pantry. Scan for some cooking oil. Paul, come on, we gotta go. The knight and the maid slam the kitchen door open, just as, Paul, you find your cooking oil. You'll never catch me! I've been running from important people all my life! I know your weakness! I run out another door. This door leads into a long dining hall. There's a tall, foreboding chandelier with dripping wax candles in it. There's a pipe organ in the corner, and a lovely view of the orchard. Are the floors still marble? Yeah. Stone and castle-style stuff seems to be the theme. 
Let Elvis get ahead of me, then pour the cooking oil all over the floor and keep running. You get to the other side of the kitchen, leaving behind a trail of cooking grease, and zip clang! The knight slips and falls down. Clang, clang, he struggles to get up. What is this on the floor? The maid tries to help him and then she slips too. No time to gloat, as much as I want to, run through the next door. Paul, I don't want to be a wet blanket, but there's probably a door to the wine cellar in the kitchen. The next space is a big living room with a luxurious leather couch, a large plasma TV, and two stone gargoyles holding the TV up. There's a tall man with slick black hair watching some kind of soap opera. He turns around when you run in, and you recognize him from the portrait. Uh, freeze. Elvis, don't make any sudden moves. Maybe he can't see us. He rises from the couch. Of course I can see you. He holds up his hand with the back palm facing towards you and you both fall to your knees, your head slamming noisily on the marble in a kowtow position. Such a dirty class of vampire to trespass against the feared Draculandru! Ow. Oh, wait. You're Draculandru? You're exactly who we were looking for! You don't look the assassin type. Most professionals wouldn't arm themselves with imported olive oil. It costs a small fortune, by the way. No, see? Uh, we were hoping to interview you. Yeah. Yeah, everyone wants to talk to you. The Dracula Andrew. Wow. Such an honor. And what? My front door was beneath you. Literally, yes. We entered through the second floor, so the front door was below us. The same portly, pencil-mustache guy that was bothering Lowry dashes into the room through another door. Oh, my lord, I'm so sorry. I was dealing with another set of riffraff at the dates. No doubt compatriots of these two. I'll send for them to be dispatched at once. Dracula Andrew waves his hand violently. Silence, Renford. I see all that you see. Know all that you know. Your simpering excuses merely test my patience. And Renford bows his head to the floor on his hands and knees. See, your greatness. We thought that if we went through legit channels and the front door, that your guy Renford would just turn us away. So, you know, only the truly bold could deserve an interview with the mighty Dracula Andrew. So we'd rather, we, uh, like, we'll get the interviewer die trying. Enough nonsense. I am one of the eldest vampires in the region. Did you not think you'd be caught? They see all. And each is trained to kill without remorse or hesitation. And all that they know... I know. What paltry news periodical could you represent? What remedial rag would make such a fatal mistake? Well, that's just it, sir. We represent ourselves. See, we have a social media channel where we post videos and sometimes we talk to other people. Yeah, so the only way for us to get ahead is to do things for ourselves. And the only way that we could get in is by risking everything. What is social media? Oh, I... <sighs> You, you, uh... You haven't heard of social media? I focus on the important things. That which accumulates power and material wealth. Not on whatever latest undignified fad has gripped the mortal livestock. Well, it's all super cutting edge and super amazing. Okay, so you know how we're all obligated to hide the fact that we're vampires? Well, the internet is all about providing so much useless and contradictory information that nobody knows what's true anymore. You can go up on there as a vampire and preach it to the world, and no one will know what to think. Nothing makes sense anymore, and the internet has driven us all further apart than we've ever been. It is easily the most powerful tool that a vampire or other evil being could want. Yeah, nowadays there's cameras everywhere. So we use the internet to make it to where you can't even believe things that you see with your own eyes. Everything is fake on the internet. Check us out. Our channel name is Big Boob, Spider-Man, Elsa. Everyone is lying to you, and we'll tell you how the sequel. That sounds ridiculous. Well, we don't, we don't write the title for people. A lot of that stuff is because a robot curates the content. Look, just look up Everyone's Lying to You and we're the top result. He motions to Renford, who hands Dracula Andrew a phone. Dracula Andrew clicks away for a few seconds and says... Ah, I am not finding you. It's just videos of these cartoon girls. No, that's us. You animate these? No, no, no. Someone else makes the software that animates them. Everything's fake, man. The local congressmen hang out in the chat and kiss up to us to score points with voters. It's a bold new world, and you need to get in on it, sir. He watches a few minutes of your video, and he goes, It's your voices coming out of these. Look how many views you have. Millions! So many comments, it says. They're praising you for this. Yeah, yeah, 
We knew once you saw it, you want to get a feel for it firsthand. If you learn to abuse this system, you could probably change the entire face of, of, of the world's politics. Can we ask you to do an interview, and in return, we'll teach you as much as we can about the internet. He scrolls through your phone in silence for a while. You're not sure if he's giving it thought, but then he says, Yes. Yes, I will do an interview. And you will teach me to manipulate people using these cartoon girls. Perhaps I have grown too reliant on my direct methods. Gentlemen, you have gambled and it has paid off. You have yourselves a deal. And you guys are released from his vice-like psychic grip and can stand up again. Ah, great. Great. This went just like we planned it. Just like we rehearsed. So how do we do this, gentlemen? I guess you could come back to our place and do a show with us. We have the gear, uh, although I'm going to need to get a replacement headset, and I guess a third one for you. Renford, arrange to get these men exactly what they need before tomorrow evening. He claps his hands, and Renford runs off. You know, we, we've had a long day. We live clear across town, and we're not opposed to staying in a hotel, but uh, we need to get there before the sun rises, you know? Say no more. You may stay in one of the guest rooms. You'll be provided with fresh meals at sunset. Oh. Okay. Great. Then, if there is nothing further, Matricia will see you to your room. The maid that was chasing you comes in behind you right on cue, motions for the two of you to follow, and she leads you to a guest room. She shows you your beds and says, Please make yourselves at home. I do not hesitate to call on us for your desires. Then she leaves. Call Lowry. Hello? Lowry! So we're in. Sorta. We met the master of the house, Dracula Andrew. One or two of the guy's servants could see us, and Drac himself has an irresistible will. It wasn't an audience on equal terms, exactly, but he's willing to do an interview for us. Mason, do I know who Dracula Andrew is? You do. You thought he was only a myth, but supposedly he's one of the reclusive vampire lords who pulls the strings around the area. He's pretty old, dating back to around the Byzantine era. It's not the oldest a vampire gets, but may the dark stars save you if you met one much older than him. Okay, Paul. You're positive you met THE Dracula Andrew. Yeah, so he tells me. And I wasn't exactly in a position to argue. What do you mean he's gonna do an interview with you? I mean he's gonna do an interview. We pitched the idea and he went for it. I'm as surprised as anyone. You're gonna do big titty anime girl interview with one of the strongest vampires in the city. Yeah, and it's gonna be a heck of an interview. Are you gonna do it tonight? No, it's, it's early. We're gonna do it tomorrow night. But... I told Pecuniaman we were gonna do this stuff tonight. You told him a lot of things. You tell everybody lots of things, but he didn't tell us certain things that would have been really, really, really important to know. Well, fine, Paul. I didn't want to get involved with the most powerful vampire in the city anyway. Look, man, you're the one who thought that Big Titty Cartoon Show was dumb. But you didn't realize it's a thousand times more sexy than private equity. What? You take that back. Never. Boobs are sexier than private equity. It's just facts. Take it... You take it back. You've never seen the true form of private equity. Neither have you. That's the whole point. Nobody knows what private equity really looks like. The mystery is what makes it attractive. Well, boobs are mysterious too sometimes. In particular to audiences in their early teens who've never really seen them. Who is our primary demographic? Oh my god. Blasphemy. I hang up on Paul. Alright, Elvis. Well then, I guess we'll go to bed and pick this up tomorrow. We go to bed. So Paul and Elvis, you wake up the next night and as soon as you rise from your lavish beds, two maids walk in carrying two unconscious, beautiful women. The women are sort of held up on silver platter trays, but they don't really fit on them, so it's more like they're just being carried. The women are decorated in tasteful garlands and roses, and as vampires you have to admit, it looks pretty appetizing. Good morning, sirs. We present your breakfast. Live virgins imported directly from France. They are free-range and fed a steady diet of healthy foods for maximal blood flow. Hello. I'm not used to people-fied versions of our food. I guess, uh, I just let Paul usually get it in directly. Well, we can't turn it down, Elvis. That'd make us rude guests. Especially after the chef spent so much time preparing the dish. Yeah, I know, Paul. But... See, aren't we supposed to suppress our animal side? Elvis, when's the last time we indulged our animal instincts? Besides, they're free-range victims. That means they're allowed to wander around and, and get exercise and chase, I, I don't know, butterflies and, or something. Indeed, sir. These women are foreign interns at our master's company. 
Please don't drink too deeply or else it will be difficult to release them back into the wild. All right. All right. I guess this is what we traded our souls for. This right here. This is what it's all about. Still, though, I feel really uncomfortable touching an unconscious woman on the neck and stuff. Do you think I could get a straw and maybe a napkin? Of course, sir. She pulls out a metal straw with a sharp bit on the end, and she hands you a blood-red cloth napkin. Thank you. I guess I wait for Paul to do his thing, then succumb to peer pressure. How does one normally indulge in an imported meal? I mean, I feel like just biting directly into the neck would be vulgar. Some vampires are of that opinion, sir. If you prefer, we can extract the blood to a glass or a container of your choosing. The copper mug has been something of a local favorite these days, because the metallic undertones pair well with the iron of the blood. Oh, yeah. I feel like that's classy, but still rugged. I'll totally take a copper mug. The maid stamps her heel sharply against the marble floor. The door opens. Another maid rushes in with a copper mug, sets it in your hands, then bows and sees herself out. One of the maids produces a sort of black obsidian knife, and with a dreamlike grace carefully drains a decent amount of breakfast into the cup before she stops the bleeding with a silver-lined cloth. I guess I awkwardly poke a straw into this other lady and then suck her blood out like a little kid. An evil little kid. You know, Elvis, I routinely bash the luxuries of the elites, but I have to admit I've never partaken in any of them. I'm not saying I condone any of this, but there does exist the possibility that we should further research the ridiculous lavishments enjoyed by those in power, so we know to be more angry about it. Next time I gotta ask for a silly straw. This is good blood. It's really good. I just, I don't know what to do with myself, and a silly straw would just lighten up the whole mood. When you're finished with your meal, the servant says, The master is waiting for you at the door. It's best to depart immediately. He's very punctual about business, and his time is valuable. Then I guess we head down. You meet with Dracula Andrew, who's wearing his outdoors cape. Gentlemen, I trust you had a good breakfast. It is the most important meal of the day. Ha, ha, ha. A little joke, because we only work at night. Shall we? And you guys all get comfortable in a glorious limousine, which conspicuously drives you to the bad part of town, where you all disembark, go down a manhole, and show Dracula Andrew your place. But that'll be in a little bit. Lowry, in the meanwhile, what did you do after you hung up on Paul? I guess I angrily drove home, stayed up fuming and muttering to myself about loyalty until the sun came out, then passed out violently on the couch from supernatural tiredness. Right. Perfect. And you completely forgot that you stole something important from someone and that you told them who you were when you did that. Yes. Where is the hard drive that you stole? Probably in Frank's glove compartment, because I was going to give it to Pecuniumin that same night. All right, well, vampires are incredibly heavy sleepers, so when you awake the next night, you find that your entire room's been tossed. Someone broke in during the day and ransacked absolutely everything. The door was kicked, so the locks are all busted, your computer's been stolen, clothes are laying everywhere, Frank's guest bed was flipped over with him in it, and he slept through the whole commotion. The cupboards are all open, your fridge has been open probably all day, so most of the blood's gone bad. There's silverware on the floor, not that you ever used it. Oh, wow. Well, I guess I'm lucky that nobody called the cops. It's a penthouse, right? So nobody else lives up here, it's just you, which is both lucky and evidently a problem. Well, great. Paul and Elvis get treated to lavishments, but here I am, waking up to my lair being wrecked. And it's not even my fault. This is all Paul's fault. If he hadn't dropped my name, no one would know that I was involved. Frank says... Lowry, I thought you gave your name and explicitly threatened to attack Ratman over the phone. That was after Paul already screwed up, so it's still all traces back to Paul. You know, I thought it was funny that you gave your name and business, but didn't booby-trap the place or anything, because you would expect them to come after that. But, obviously, they'd know that I'm expecting them, so they wouldn't come because they'd know that I would booby-trap the place. Yet, obviously, they did come anyway. Of course. Well, we're dealing with another private equity firm. We all deal in layers upon layers of inscrutability. They must have known that I'd expect them to know that I'd booby-trapped the place, and, realizing that I was expecting them to think that I'd laid booby traps, they acted in the comfort of knowing that I hadn't. They were one level above me, Frank. I've made the mistake of underestimating Ratman. He is a peer, after all. I should have expected better from the man who stole the beans and Tupperware account. Yeah, that all makes perfect sense. But now he'd expect that I know that he knows things, which means that he expects me to be one level above him. So to trick him, I need to be two levels above and continue behaving as though I haven't been attacked at all. He won't expect that. Okay. So we're doing nothing. This is what I love most about being a vampire who works in private equity, Frank. The endless mind games which are only suited to supernatural genius.
Yeah, it's pretty great. Mason, do I still have my phone? You turn over a couple of things, but no, your phone is gone. Frank, did they steal your phone? Frank goes into his room, checks around for a little bit, then comes back empty-handed. Dang it. Did they take your car keys? Frank looks around, can't find his keys. Did they take my keys? You can't find your keys either. Oh no. Frank, they probably tossed our cars. We need to go. You head out to the parking garage and you have to curse these modern remote systems that help you find your car. Because sure enough, the doors are unlocked, both cars have been searched, and the glove compartment is missing the hard drive. Dang it! Kick Frank's car out of anger. This is such crap. A vampire's enemy shouldn't operate during the day. It's against the rules. His enemy should be vampires. All right, we need to get in touch with Paul and Elvis. We need as much or as little muscle as we can muster. We're going back to Ratman's place. So we're going to take the bus? Did they leave your wallet? Did they... Mason, did they take my wallet? Yes, they took your wallet. Kick Frank's car again. It's fine. We're vampires. We don't need wallets. We have evil powers. I will sway the will of the bus driver. Paul and Elvis, you guys have led one of the most powerful vampires that you're ever likely to meet underground into your sewer lair. He brought friends, of course, and you're outnumbered about three to one by some rather stern-looking men who've made the mistake of wearing suits down here. See, the trick is, you bring a spare pair of pants and then keep your good clothes in a plastic bag. When you arrive at your home, it looks like the place has probably been searched, but it's a lot harder to tell in the disorganized mess. Of course, the intrusion becomes evident when one of the big guide guards from Ratman's business rounds the corner and freezes. Oh my god! An assassin! Dracula Andrew holds out his hand and the guy is sucked into his grasp with a magnetic power. The guard's arms and legs lurch forward with a sudden stop and his neck lands in Drac's palm. You hear a snap and the guard goes limp. An assassin? Or rather, an expert one if so. But he does have a peculiar, inhuman look to him. Dracula Andrew turns his body around and examines the body. Yeah, you're right. Uh, but wait, I think I recognize that guy. He works for a private equity dude named Cheesley Ratman. Private equity. Ah, but then it does all make sense. I have many enemies in private equity. Likely some fool thought he'd make a name for himself. The underlings must sometimes be reminded of their place. Yeah, yeah, I got the address if you want it. Where do you know this Ratman from? I know another guy in private equity. Ratman's an enemy of his. He's not a vampire, though. He's like a werewolf or something. Hmm. A werewolf or something. Well, I shall loan you someone to look further into it. For now, I believe it is time for our show, yes? Yes, sir. You can hang the body on the coat rack if you want. We got our system set up over here. Dracula Andrew politely hangs the body on the coat rack, then sits down next to you. He gets a fancy new VR helmet on and starts browsing through the selection of avatars. Which one should I use? He asks. My favorite is the sexy Velociraptor. This... this one? Is it sexy? Yeah, that's a really sexy Velociraptor. How can you tell? It's got thick eyelashes. So is that sexy to other Velociraptors? A lot of our viewers just fill in the blanks with their imagination. So it'll be sexy to them, yeah. Okay, and the idea is to be sexy and not like someone that you would hire from a job interview. The whole point is to obfuscate reality and be totally inscrutable, sir. That way, no matter what you say, you can always play it off as a joke or skate by on the defense that you're not really trying and everyone else is a tryhard for taking you seriously. So, we are stupid on purpose. And, and just try to keep it about like 30% stupid on purpose. It's good if you're earnestly just kind of dumb, like 30% dumb all the time. All right, so we're going to go live in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Hello, Internet. We are some kind of show with a difficult to remember name, and this show is 100% about you. Today, we're going to play video games, and we're currently having an angry drama with our competitor, Fox and Soxer. I don't like these ticks and toxer. We find his content to be tedious. It's so tedious. I've heard he doesn't like horses. We've got the lowdown, but first, joining us is his sexy velociraptor, Dracula Andrew, the most powerful vampire in the city. I, I... Powerful, vampiric, sexy velociraptor. Everything may or may not be true, and it is entirely up to you to decide what is real. We're not peddling misinformation. You are. And I guess from here on, we just do the show. Did I yell at the congressman again, threaten to have Dracula Andrew beat him up. The congressman actually knows who Dracula Andrew is and logs off when you suggest that that should happen. Otherwise, it's basically your typical online show. It draws in millions of views. Ten years from now, no one's going to be able to say why. Dracula Andrew kind of loosens up midway through and begins to have fun with it. 
He gets into the swing of throwing out real facts along with blatantly fake ones, and pretty soon you guys don't know what's real anymore either, because he knows so many things that you don't. At one point he says the devil himself is physically on Earth controlling a lot of the world, and Drax seems dead serious about it, but you don't know how to slow down to ask him if that is serious. Uh, you did really good, sir. That was some good avatar use for your first time. I am Lord of Vampires. I know my way around social behavior. But I see the appeal and the power of this concept. I am getting on it late, but with the right funding and a whole network to create and feed its own drama, I believe I could start to take over the entire social perspective of the internet. Not a soul would know fact from fiction, and only I would preside over the chaos. Exactly the sentiment spoken by powerful dictators like Stalin and Mark Zuckerberg, sir. With a big picture mentality, the online world is your confused oyster. There is much work to do. I shall take my leave now. I will leave you with my man, Finger Splitter, to help you with your Ratman problem. Is there anything else I can do for you as a show of thanks for introducing me to this new power? Well, sir, I like to collect things. A glass of wine to commemorate the occasion would be nice. I think a Columbia Valley Cabernet would be great from the shelf. 2006 is supposed to be a good year. Rather specific. It would impress a friend of mine. I don't know if you have that, but I trust a guy like you keeps a well-stocked vintage cellar. Of course. It's a common gift among the well-to-do mortals. I'll have my people see what's available. Now, I won't keep you waiting, gentlemen. And Dracula Andrew sweeps out of the room, leaving behind a somewhat chiseled-looking vampire in a suit. Finger Splitter has a scar down his face and a really narrow look in his eye. Finger Splitter, how are you, my man? Eager to find out my lord's time isn't being wasted. Let's go find out what we all have to do with it, can we? Sure, let me just call up one of my buddies. I think we got a beat on this. Lowry, it's around now that you arrived just outside the sewers where Paul and Elvis live. Put on a pair of plastic baggies to protect my nice shoes. You brought your own baggies, right, Frank? Uh, no, I didn't. Oh, you can probably use some potato chip bags or something from the gas station over there. I'm going ahead. Should we split up? What if Ratman's waiting for us down there in the sewers? And what if they are? Obviously, they didn't want to kill us, or otherwise we'd have woken up with stakes through our hearts. Do you think they know that doesn't really work? It still would have been profoundly inconvenient. The point is, they didn't do it. I'll see you in 10 or 15. Mason, I go ahead. You wind your way through the sewers until you find Paul and Elvis's lair. Paul is on the phone while some scary-looking Scarface dude is looming over him. Paul, get off the phone. We have important business to do. And good evening to you, Mr. Scarface. Oh, Larry. Well, I was just calling you. I've told you a thousand times, don't call me unless it's important. I call you. Yeah, well, I motioned to the body on the coat rack. We had a visitor, and I was curious if you did too. Yes, but unlike you, they actually stole some things from me. My wallet, my phone, and my house keys for one. What do you suppose they're gonna do with all our stuff? So right, says Splitter. You've been stolen from by these guys before. Yeah, when I said assassin, I didn't mean for your boss. I meant they were here to assassinate me. Maybe Elvis. So what? You think maybe they're just crazed fans? They shouldn't be. The whole point of our show is that everything's fake. They've got no idea what we look like or how we live. Either way, doesn't seem like Dracula Andrew's problem. Probably not. But I trust if you go home on just our word for it, Dracula Andrew's not going to be satisfied. I expect you're right. So how about we get to the root of it? We can go to Ratman's office, rough up his guys, take his stuff, find out what his aim is, and then you can give a thorough account to the boss and hopefully some charming details about the whole incident. How now? Don't go thinking we're all chummy. There's a possibility that you were dumb enough to hire a third party and try in something. So I'm not going to rough this Ratman guy up. I'm going to kill him. Then we're going to find out how you're connected to him, what he knows about vampires, why he knows about vampires, and if you're responsible for that in any way. Just doing my due diligence. That's fine. So long as it doesn't come back to us, Ratman disappearing somewhere is probably better for us. In fact, we're lucky he didn't involve the police. I suppose he could have. I don't know. It'd be kind of suspicious he knows that we live in the sewers and where, but never reported us before. Like, why does he know that? And besides, we just relocate. We get found sometimes. Well, it's a pain for those of us who can't just be invisible. Can't you just talk your way out of jail? Yes, but sometimes the police come by during the day, and what am I supposed to do then? Look, we're all well aware of how inconvenient our night lives are, and how our amazing powers offset that weakness, except for some very frustrating times when they don't work. Could we all just please move along and go see this Ratman guy? Yeah, sure. Just let me make sure he's in. Paul, give me your phone. And Larry the phone. But aren't office hours closed at night? There's still a receptionist. Mason, I call the office. Hello, Cheesley Ratman and Associates. Hi, 
This is Larry and Larry Services calling to demand my wallet, you kleptomaniac freak. Oh, hold on, sir. I was told if you called to patch you through. There's a tone, and then another line picks up. Hello, this is Cheesley Ratman. Is this Lowry? Ratman, you thieving rodent. Give me back my stuff. Or what, Lowry? You're going to call the police? Tell him we stole your stuff back while you were in a vampiric slumber? You stole my car keys, Ratman. And the beans and Tupperware account. And also, I guess, a VR helmet or something? I don't really care about that, though. Well, tell you what, Lowry. Why don't you come down to my office and we'll smooth things over, okay? I got a feeling that neither of us want too much of our operations out in the daylight. And a prolonged war is not profitable to either of us, is it? All right, fine. I'll be there in a half hour. I hang up. Ha! Joke's on him. I don't care if it is profitable. I'm going to take him down with me out of spite if I have to. Never cross Lowry. They're going to write that on my gravestone. So we all take in your car? No, my keys were stolen. Does Scarface have a car? I didn't bring mine. Sounds like public transportation for us, then. It's the humiliation. The degradation. This is why I have to kill Ratman. Only blood can wash away these sins. So I take it you all ride the bus down to Ratman's. I stop to get a cherry slurpee and throw it up in the trash can next to the bus stop, but yeah. You might worry about alienating Splitter, but he's almost definitely seen worse vampire neurosis than this in all his years. Yours are a powerful, insane people. Anyway, you arrive at the strip mall where Ratman is located in about 45 minutes. Is this it? Splitter asks. Doesn't look like much. Obviously, you're not familiar with shell companies and tax evasion. Ratman is just the toenail of a much larger beast. You'll see. I lead the way inside. The receptionist goes, Oh, I recognize you now. You know, you really had me worried the cleaning guy was dead. Sorry. The whole thing was an elaborate lie, but we didn't want to see you again, so it seemed okay at the time. Well, Mr. Ratman's ready to see you now. Barge through the door. Just like before, the lights aren't on, but it appears that you can all see each other perfectly well. Ratman is sitting at his desk. He's got the computer hard drive out in front of him. On either side of him are two strong, fat-looking guards. They're built like grizzly bears. Stocky, slouching, huge beards making them look really hairy. Lowry, my honored guest, come on, sit down. Grab the chair and toss it violently against the wall. With your vampire strength, the chair embeds itself deep into the drywall. I was gonna sit down, and then you told me what to do. Anything you have to offer is tainted. You broke into my home, Ratman. Corporate espionage is one thing, but I draw the line at leaving the fridge open and letting all the food go bad. You always say you won't eat that old stuff. Shut up, Paul. Frank eats it. All right, I know we've had a series of misunderstandings. You really wanted the beans and Tupperware account. I really wanted that VR headset. I didn't realize you were connected or else I wouldn't have robbed you twice in one day. Though in fairness to me, the beans and Tupperware account was totally square. It was also round-shaped. If you'd really done the research, you'd realize that Tupperware comes in a variety of shapes. Well, how can I make this right, Lowry? Now, you took this hard drive. And then I got it back. And now I have your wallet and your car keys. You can replace all that stuff at some point. However, I also happen to know that your half of the room is all vampires. No. No, we're not. Splitter says, how'd you find that out? And Ratman replies, Lowry's not the only one who's got spies. These two, Paul and Lowry, they are hard to track down, but the pieces started to click together when I realized that they weren't human. Of course, all it took was seeing them in the flesh for the first time for that to set in. Yeah, and what are you, Ratman? Most people can't see us unless we want to be seen. Just a good old-fashioned mammal, like most people. And probably of a more social variety than all of you. So at any rate, I've been looking into what types of people care about vampires, and here's what I propose to make this all go away. I give Lowry his wallet and his car keys. I'll buy you a new VR headset, and I can cut you in for a consulting fee on the Beans and Tupperware account. After all that, I won't call anybody special to check you guys out. Unacceptable. You think you can just drop a two-ton mystery on our lap like this and have us walk away not knowing who pulls the strings? I can't do it! Before anyone can realize what happened, Splitter reaches underneath his shirt, pulls out what appears to be a bayonet, and then flings it into the forehead of one of the big men. The guy, now with the bayonet sticking out at an angle through his head, stumbles back a few steps, falls on his butt, then reaches up and grabs the handle. Well... What is this? Funny, that usually kills him. Elvis, desk flip on number two. Hup, I leaped to the other side of the desk. Oh god, grab the hard drive. We toss the desk at the other guard. Wham! The desk breaks into several pieces and the man stumbles backwards, but he's so big and heavy he actually handles it surprisingly well. Now hold on a second. He lunges forward and grabs at Elvis, who's nimble enough to leap out of the way. 
Jump down and grab the guy's feet. All right, you get his feet. Tackle high. Splinter steps towards the guy with the knife in his head. I'm gonna need that back. No. No, no, no. The guy gets up and starts trying to run from Splitter, and Splitter gives chase. Elvis, you tackle the bear the rest of the way over. Paul, the bear whose legs you're holding, effortlessly kicks out of your grasp, then wraps his legs around you, giving a tremendous squeeze. Uh, okay, Elvis, help! Jab my thumbs in the guy's eyes. He howls in pain as you dig your thumbs into his eye sockets. Lowry, what are you doing? Slap Ratman. Ow! Hey! He gets up and he slaps you back. All right, what is it with you? You can't just do whatever I do. Paul! Try and squeeze out of the guy's legs. You are trapped tight, and it feels like your ribs are going to explode. Elvis! Use one of my hands to cover the guy's nose and mouth. (laughs) All right, go in for the cheap suffocation trick. He grabs your arm and gives it a savage yank, tearing you off balance and causing you to go belly up towards the ceiling. He then wraps his arms around your neck and puts you in a rear naked choke. (laughs) That's how you do it. Oh my god. Paul, Lowry, you guys are useless. He's so strong, Lowry! Lowry, what now? Run. Through the window. Just run right through it. Okay, sensing that this is not going well, you take the hard drive and just run full tilt through the window. It gives way to your vampire superiority and on you continue into the parking lot. Hey! Ratman shouts. He's getting away! Meanwhile, Splitter has cornered the guy with a knife in his head. All right, tell you what, you promise to sit here and we can just leave it in, okay? The guy nods in terrified agreement. Help us! Help us! Splitter runs up and he grabs Ratman and puts him in a chokehold. Hey, you on the floor. I've got your boss. If you want me to pump his head off like a wine cork, then keep choking my guys. The big guy looks at the two of you who are struggling. So, don't let him go? Ratman says, let him go, you idiot! And the big guy lets you go. Thanks, Splitter. Uh, I mean, uh, <laughs> we probably would have figured a way out. That felt pretty bad, but, but we, we usually figure it out. All right, I'm going to take your boss for a little walk. The two of you stay here, and when the cops come by to check this place out, try not to make it look suspicious. The guy that had you goes, uh, how do we do that? Ratman says, just leave. Have everyone grab their stuff and go. The details will sort themselves out. Go home. The big guys scramble to their feet and hurry out of the room. Lowry, where are you headed? Probably to the bus stop and then down to see Pecunian. The others will find me eventually. Actually, I just realized I left Frank somewhere again. That's all right. Hey, we got the hard drive back. Go team! Onward to Pecunian. Oh, wait, you forgot the wine. Ah, uh, dang it. Okay, go back. So where do you guys go to wait for your wine delivery? Well, we have a hostage now, Mason, but we can only ride the bus. See, Paul, this is why Wonder Woman has an invisible jet. You can't steal it if you can't find it. Does she even still have an invisible jet, Elvis? I'm pretty sure that's old school Wonder Woman. Besides, they stole my keys, not the entire car. Well, Larry, maybe the keys to the jet are invisible too. I don't think fighter jets have keys like a conventional car. It's more like just very hard to get them off the runway unless you know what you're doing. To be honest, I don't really read Wonder Woman comics. I don't even know where she keeps the jet parked. I'm just saying, an invisible car would have been perfect for this. Sure, but at any rate, what do we do with our hostage now? All right, you. We're going to ride the bus to a lousy part of town, and you're going to sit there and be cool about it. The average mortal can't see these two goons, point to Elvis and Paul. And I don't know about this splitter guy. Can't see me if I don't like it. Right. So if you panic, they're going to put you in a crazy house for thinking you've been kidnapped by invisible men. Retman goes, fine. But I don't know what you expect to get out of me. All I took was a VR helmet, and scooping up an account is just normal business. What are you going to find out, that I'm Cheesley Ratman? Guilty as charged. We're going to find out who you work for, Cheesley. Oh, sure, yeah, yeah. I bet the guy towards the bottom rung has all the answers. All it would take is one IRS agent asking little old me some questions, and the lid gets blown off the entire private equity firm. Yeah, right. Oh, what's that? Paul, I think he's saying we can't get the answers by torturing him, which makes your plan stupid. That's not what he's saying. He's saying we can't get correct answers. But with enough torture, we could definitely get some answers. I'm willing to act on the answers that we get. Wait, if we're sure that he doesn't know anything, why are we even taking him? Well, I've got some questions, Splitter says. Oh, okay. All right, shut up. Everyone be cool. I think this is our bus. 
The bus rounds the corner and Ratman is escorted on board by three men that no one else can see. Lowry follows in and 45 minutes later, you're back in the bad part of town and about to head into the sewers. Ratman goes, Oh wait, are we going back to your sewer layer? But everyone knows where that is at this point. Are you guys trying to get jumped? Shut up. Don't help us. I know that you know about the lair, which means that you wouldn't expect us to be there because you know that I know, which means that you won't send people to the lair in the first place. I mean, I would just send a guy to cover my bases. That seems like a waste of resources. I can't believe you stole the beans and Tupperware account. You're so inefficient. Well, before we lose you to our own idiocy, why don't you tell us what you know, Ratman? All I know is that someone higher up the chain of subsidiaries told me to find Elvis and Paul. We had a general location based on your internet service provider and a few other details that we were able to dig up. But beyond that, you're phantoms. It took me the better part of three years in greasing quite a few palms before I realized that you were literally underground. Then once I found you, word came down to physically steal a VR headset and send it on up the chain. I don't know who asked or why. So in theory, if we daisy chain our torture up the hierarchy of your business, eventually we'll find out who stole our VR headset. Paul, I feel as maligned as you about having our stuff stolen, but this has already been just a lot. I'm not sure I want to spend my immortal life trying to understand corporate structure. It is always changing. I've made it my immortal life goal, and I'm still working on navigating that field. All right, this is crap. The IRS may accept that they can't do anything about you because you're more trouble than they can deal with, but I am petty and tireless, and I'm going to keep going even if I forget why I started. This is why we need pecuniumen, Paul. Just let that man do his magic. You guys got in touch with Derek Pecuniuman? You guys really are some of the shadiest kooks in the business. You guys make your way down to your lair and you find a hideous vampire standing there in plain view. He holds out a bottle of wine to you, and when you take it, he says, With kind regards from the master, his many thanks and his assurance that he is always watching to reward further good deeds. And then you blink and the vampire is gone. Alright, I know that trick like the back of my palm. If you're gonna hang out down here, we got some blood in the fridge, but you gotta start with the bags in the back, okay? Those are the old ones. Splitter kinda looks into the empty space next to you and shrugs. No sense sitting around here like sitting ducks. Let's get the wine and hard drive to Pecuniumen and lay low until we got the information that we need. Splitter asks, is this Pecuniumen thing gonna be long? Probably. He has to untangle a hierarchy that's intentionally designed to be impossible for the whole IRS to understand. You guys go ahead then. I got a few more things bothering me about Ratman here. You mind if I have an accident if I hang the body next to the other one? Yeah, we don't actually use that coat rack for coats, so it's nice to see it getting used. Right. I'll keep in touch then. You guys take a cab down to Pecuniumen's house and wake him up in the dead of night. You offer him the wine and the hard drive. What? Well, that was extremely punctual. I hope you didn't let my wife know I was the one looking for this. We didn't even see her, my man. We got it from the husband, I think. Oh, all right. Well, I'll just start cracking this open. You wire me the money for the job, and I'll call you in a few days when I know who benefited from your beans and Tupperware account, and if I can see who might have asked for that VR headset. All right, see you around, Pecuniumen. Paul, Elvis, do you guys have money for a nice hotel? We do actually have a lot of money, but don't you also have a lot of money? My wallet was stolen, and that's going to make it hard to look for a place. I don't want to hear about it. Look, just book the most expensive hotel suite that you can find and get ready to pay a whopping room service fee because I'm going to treat this like a vacation. Why would you have a room service fee? We don't eat or drink anything. I need whiskey and vermouth for my meals. And also, I like to berate the staff, so I'm going to order stuff, criticize it, and then throw it away. You know what? Sure. I haven't taken the time to properly scope out the city's museums and stuff. You know, Lowry, you can shout at room service. Elvis, you and I can hang out at the park and feed the ducks. It'll be nice to get some time off. Well, I wonder if the ducks are out at night. That's going to kill our video viewership, though. Okay, well, we'll use the hotel Wi-Fi to broadcast our shows, and then we'll do the vacation stuff afterward. If that works on our timetable, how come we never did vacation stuff before this? Well, because I've always been busy with Lowry's jobs, and you've been busy trying to learn how to make your own jigsaw puzzles by hand. Ah, yes, my jigsaw puzzles. It's an artistic endeavor. But okay, yeah, that's, that's good. I'll take a break from those. All right, you guys lay low for a few days. Splitter calls you before Pecuniumen does, and he says that he learned some interesting stuff. But he's going to catch up to you when you've got some info on your end and you'll trade. Pecuniumen calls a few days later. Hello, Larry. I have some fascinating and possibly terrible news. It turns out the being a Tupperware thing was purely Ratman. That, of course, got shuffled around to a bunch of subsidiaries who each claimed the losses from it as tax write-offs, saving them millions going up the chain. That's just business as usual. 
But I was able to look into the VR headset thing, and you won't believe it, but that order just keeps on going. Wait. No, that that's not correct. Pecuniaman, the important thing is the Beans and Tupperware account. You're, you're telling me that that was just typical peanuts, but Paul having his headset stolen, that goes all the way up to the top. The top is only as far as I could trace it. As far as recorded electronic correspondence goes, the head of Res Imperium specifically requested it. Do I know who Res Imperium is? Yeah. Ultimately, all private equity actually belongs to about two or three companies. Res Imperium is the sort of master company that owns all the subsidiaries that make up its complex network of partners. All cash flow eventually comes back to them after everything has been written off as a loss. In theory, they lose billions of dollars per year, even in spite of receiving billions of dollars in federal tax subsidies. They're believed to be one of the wealthiest firms in existence and feature a variety of major politicians as key stockholders. This is like hearing that a power above the U.S. government stole Paul's VR headset. Pecuniaman, I swear, if you are giving me a false lead, I will come to your house and I will personally break you in half. Larry, I would not have chased it so far if I wasn't so curious myself. I had to beg like you wouldn't believe for this. I called in favors from people I'm not proud to grovel to. And part of the only reason I made any headway at all is because it is so ridiculously petty. Even then, I met resistance and had to spend a fair amount of blackmail to crack it open. People didn't want to talk about it. I haven't even seen this level of reticence about the actual billions of dollars of fraud that the firm is committing. Paul's VR headset is involved in some of the most insider-style collusion that I've seen in years. I... I don't believe you. I was skeptical you would. I thought I'd have answers when I got to the end of it, but the last I could crack was Kerry Avon, the owner of Res Imperium itself. That's not a man that I can get through, so I can't give you a reason and I don't know why. But that headset eventually fell into the hands of Carrie Avel. No. 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 But he cared about the Beans and Tupperware account, right? Like I say, it was just another loss to get claimed multiple times throughout the company's structure. Carrie probably never even heard about Beans and Tupperware. Okay. Uh, all right. So, so Paul and Elvis seem to be really important to Carrie Avel, a man who basically controls and destroys an enormous amount of the global economy. Larry, can I ask you a favor? If you pursue this any further, and, and you find out, can you please tell me why he stole that headset? At this point, I need to know. It is a mystery left clawing at the inside of my soul. Mine too, Pecuniaman. Mine too. I hang up. Was that Pecuniaman? Yes. Splitter materializes next to you. Great, what'd we learn? Oh my god. I don't care how important you are, Splitter. Pa and Elvis do this so often that no matter how ominous you thought it would seem to reveal that you could be here at any time, I mostly just find it annoying. Sorry, but I can be here at any time. You're gonna kill me with a heart attack. Anyway, I'm still mentally processing what I learned. Pecuniaman says that Carrie Avum, the owner of one of the world's most powerful private equity firms, is the one who stole Paul's headset. Actually, I might even work for him, I don't know. The structure above me is too complicated. See, that's interesting, because I had a chat with your Ratman, and I found out that he's basically a changeling. See, a changeling is a supernatural creature that steals a child and then replaces the child with a child of its own. Kind of like cowbirds do by laying eggs in another bird's nest. Human parents take care of the baby until it's grown, and then its true nature gets revealed. Ratman didn't know what was going on up the chain, but he and his buddies were all changelings. More specifically, Ratman and his friends were animals, transformed into people, then used to replace human children. Wait a minute. Are you kidding? One of the most powerful men in the world, who's also somehow connected to a bunch of changeling animal children, stole my VR headset. Yeah, and the boss is really keen to know who's making the changelings and how deep it goes. Stealing your headset might be the biggest mistake they've ever made. Oh my god. I've always dreamed of this day. I knew I'd crack the conspiracy that runs the world like an egg one day. I just had no idea that the egg would be thrown at my face! This is amazing! But why Paul and Elvis? Maybe Carrie Avum just likes our show. No. No, I refuse to accept that pretending to be big titty anime girls somehow gave you mental access to the leaders of a global conspiracy. Big titty is more powerful than big business. No! No, it isn't! You're not even real! Look at you! You're one of the ugliest things in this entire city! None of this is right! Look. I came here expecting that this conspiracy was going to be city-wide. That's what the boss is mainly concerned with. But my boss isn't at the top of his chain, and if he can go up the ladder with information about who, or what, pulls the strings internationally, well that's promotional material right there. 
Buck up, Lowry. A rising tide floats all ships. And if Drac does well, your fortune is soon to follow. I'll let the boss know who got this pecuniuman guy. Splitter pulls out his phone. Looks like this Avon fella's got a big home in northern New York. That's competitive territory vampire was, but I'm going to book us some tickets and fly out tonight. Let's see if the boss can swing us some contracts. Pack your bags, boys. We've got to move quick if you plan to catch a meal. Well, I'm ready to go. Let's go. I'll eat on the plane. I'll, I'll, I only have this one pair of clothes. Same. You know, just because you look ugly doesn't mean that you have to be ugly. And how you suck. I hate you guys. You get used to people not really noticing you. I can be as ugly as I want. Great. I'll meet everyone at the airport after I've talked it over with the boss. Splitter then vanishes. Call a cab right away. Come on, guys, let's go! We gotta learn the big conspiracy! We're the center of the big conspiracy! You're the center of it. I drag my feet and mope the entire way downstairs. You guys drive down to the airport. Splitter meets up with you in about a half hour after you tell him where you are. He hands Larry a ticket for coach and says, Some first class seats ought to be open. I'll have a look. Then why am I in coach? No, I am not going to be degraded further. I go to the ticket counter and I upgrade my flight and then I check in. I guess the rest of us just walk past security. Uh, there's probably a lot of cameras around an airport, though, isn't there? Yeah, but they'd only check them if there's an incident, so it's probably fine. Actually, this is a bit of a risk, but you're in a hurry. You guys board the plane, and there's a few empty seats in first class that you can occupy. A few hours later, you're in New York. You drive out a ways in a rental car, then find a spot at a little bed and breakfast near your final stop. Splitter pulls out his phone. So we were able to get the blueprints for the house. It'll be heavily guarded by my guests, and based on how the two of you did breaking into our mansion, I don't like your odds as it stands. So I'm going to go pick up a composite bow and some heavy-duty neurotoxins. We'll put on some masks, go in swift, quietly, and grab Avon. After that, we'll pump him for information, demand a massive Bitcoin deposit to a foreign government or something, and we'll figure out what to do with him once we learn a bit more. Wait, if we make this about a foreign government, won't the international authorities try all the harder to figure out who's responsible? Sure, but what's he going to do if we drop him off in that country? Right now, that's the most likely turnout as I see it. Okay, and how about extraction for us? How are we going to get him to ride the bus? I was thinking we'd run him down to a sailboat, then join up with another group of vampires. The boss has a friend with his own home and people that you can't find on the map. Mr. Splitter, this is actually our first time doing something kind of like this at this scale. Are you sure that you want to trust us with neurotoxins? Don't worry, I'll handle the neurotoxins. Do I have to go? All hands on deck, Lowry. But what am I supposed to do? You saw the guards that Ratman had. Once a guy like that pins down Paul and Elvis, I want you to run up and put a boot in his head. Isn't that what the neurotoxins are for? Why would I- Yeah, but what if I can't get to him? Actually, come to think, I lied. You're gonna work with neurotoxins too. I'm gonna get you some knives. Even if you cut yourselves by accident, your hearts don't beat, so you're not in danger. I'm really a lot more comfortable with the talking role. Well, this isn't a social visit, so get comfortable outside of it. We're gonna leap the fence, take out anyone in the way of the target, then nab him during dinner. We'll rush out, meet our new friends, and it's as simple as that. No one should be on their toes for it. I love it! It's perfect! It's just how I imagined breaking a global conspiracy would go! That, and I would have some kind of physical evidence that would be easy to explain to even the dumbest person! All this business partner stuff is just sort of dumb. I hate how long it would take to explain, but the evil changeling thing, that's perfect! Does anyone have anything to add to the plan? Is any of this negotiable? No. Well, I guess there's no better place to get the job experience than starting at the very highest level. It can go on our resume, and even if we screw it up, we're still gonna fail upward. We'll get trusted with more high-stakes kidnappings down the line, and then we'll fail those too until pretty soon we're the boss of all kidnappings. There's the spirit. You guys wake up the next day as the sun is setting, take a taxi on down to your target location, and then scope the place out. The mansion is perched up on a hill, and down below is the ocean and a set of docks. There's a small sloop sailing nearby that Splitter points out as your ride. You're handed knives, which are coated in some kind of fast-acting toxin, and Splitter gets out a bow and arrows. You all head around back, staying close to the tall privacy fence. All right, on the count of three, I'm going to hop over and shoot down any guards I can spot. I don't care how strong they are, if they've got a pulse, this poison ought to freeze up their spines. Ready? What if I say no? All right, Lowry, listen to me. If you do this, Draculandrew is going to know that you're a useful person. And I mean with a diverse set of skills. And a decisive guy, too, all right? The higher-up jobs. It's not just about working hard all the time, doing the same things all day. It's about creativity and taking risks. Yeah, but risk management is also a part of those jobs. Well, in that case, you gather up some lesser expendables, and if they screw up, you pretend they don't exist. Got it? Yes, 
Yes, I get exactly what's going on, but that took a turn into being a terrible pep talk. You be valuable enough and you won't be expendable anymore. Or we'll do this and be loose ends who know too much. Just throwing that out there. Paul, I thought you were with me on this. Oh yeah, no, I am ready to die for this. Just keeping it real, man, I know how this stuff works. Alright, come on, Lowry, this is probably your only chance to meet the king of private equity in the next 200 years at least. And probably Dracula Andrew is gonna kill us after this no matter what. <sighs> Fine. Could I get some motive? Aside from your inevitable death? I mean, what do you want to do, go back and do crochet? What if this turns out okay and you missed out on everything? What if there's something really cool in that building? I guess there could be something really cool in there. I hope you're right, Paul. If we go in there and there's nothing neat to see, I don't know if I want to do more high-profile kidnappings. Well, it's our first one. I mean, we'll see how it is and figure it out from there. Great. Is everyone ready, then? Got all your willies shaking out. I'm ready. Still ready. I get to ask Avum about some insider information. If that's fine, then I'm in. I guess I just hope we see something cool. Let's go! I leap up and pull myself over the fence. I was gonna say three, but okay. Splitter pulls himself over. Over the fence. Up we go. You all land on the other side. There's a single guard wandering around by the pool. Splitter files off an arrow, he yelps a little, then falls in the pool. Go, go! You run up the hill, then you see an old-looking guy with a napkin and his dress shirt come out to the window. Several other old guys appear behind him, and you recognize some of them. It's a bunch of politicians. Senators and congressmen from both aisles of politics. They start to panic. Run right through the window. You run right through it, splashing the old men with glass as they make frightened old man sounds. Oh, what the hooch! Splitter runs in immediately behind you. Jump on top of one of the old guys I don't recognize. Do you follow politics well enough to recognize any of these guys? No. Well, then you tackle none other than Congressman Dickerson from your home state. Are you the old guy that we're looking for? Ah, ah, help! Uh, Pardon me, Senators, Congressman. I'm so sorry to intrude on whatever's going on here. You're darn right you're going to be sorry, announces one of the old men. He pulls a gold inlaid whip out from underneath his suit jacket. You are about to get a beating from the party whip! Another congressman tries to motion for him to stop. Wait, if he is willing to talk, I'm willing to negotiate and cede on almost everything. We surrender, sir. Well, then, I straighten myself up. Yes, I'm definitely just here to talk and accept your surrender. Then I surrender. The congressman with the whip pulls out a lighter. Are you kidding me? I'm going to burn this entire place to the ground. He walks over to the wooden dining table and holds the lighter up to it. We're all going to die now! It's for our own good! One old guy who looks particularly like a vulture starts to make a run for it. Splitter goes, that's the one, that's our guy. I get up and I tackle that one. I'm sorry, this is my first high-profile kidnapping, I don't know who's who. The two politicians are now negotiating. Now see here, instead of burning down the entire building, could we possibly just burn this table? Or maybe form a committee to investigate the table to see if it's done anything wrong, then form a committee to decide what to do about the table once we have our findings. The other congressman says, No! I would rather die! That I take you with me is merely the greatest pleasure of my endeavor! I only wish that I could kill more of you in particular! So, uh, are we, are we, let's go, everyone! I pick up Carrie Avum and throw him over my shoulder. A little help, gentlemen, Carrie cries. The guy with the lighter says, what do you think I'm doing? Once your house burns down, these assailants will perish. The one that offered surrender seems flummoxed for a second, then inspiration strikes. He pulls a huge wad of hundred bills out of his pocket. He walks up, then he sticks it in Avum's shirt pocket. There you are, good man. And I'm terribly sorry about everything. The whip guy goes, Why don't you just give the assailants your money, idiot? Oh, you think I should? He starts to reach into his pockets. No, I was being facetious! You there, criminals! You should be taking the money from him directly! Don't let him give it to you! You need to take! And you! He points back at the congressman. You pathetic victim! If you resist him in any way, I will strike you with my whip! Uh, okay, I'll just- I'll just take your whole wallet, okay? That would be best. Here you are. I, I'm so sorry again. Alright, well, I guess uh, if no one's gonna stop me, I'm gonna go. I leave the way I came. You guys get back outside to the pool, and inside the politicians have managed to set the table on fire. About half of them applaud vigorously, and the other half look really concerned, but don't do anything to help themselves. Does anyone want to intervene? I mean, where's the guards? Someone should be protecting them. Avum says, well, it's not every day I'm assaulted in my own home. Bertrand was the only guard on duty this time of night. 
Bertrand's corpse floats by you guys in the pool. The fire spreads quickly, and the house bursts fully into flame within minutes. Without anyone to help them, the politicians have destroyed themselves. They were all insane time bombs, Avum says. I tried to wrangle them as well as I could, but I suppose the burden is lifted now. I can rest at last. Take me away. But it, w weren't you controlling them? Control? No, you don't control politicians any more than you herd cats. No, no, they have terrible attention spans and no sense of self-awareness. I just try to attract them to certain ideas with their natural food substance, giant piles of money. The stress was putting me in an early grave. Uh, man, no, no, no. Okay, you can't just be a victim of the world that's enabling you, okay? You have to be the head evil that runs everything uh, against everyone else's will. Or, or else this just doesn't work. Wait a minute, are you Paul from that YouTube video? The Paul? Yeah, that's right, the one you stole the VR headset from. And look what it got you. It wasn't I who desired the headset. If you're looking for answers, you're looking for the one above me. The one man who controls Res Imperium from the shadows. Paul and Elvis, he'd like to meet you more than anything. He's an enormous fan. Oh my god. Wait, so one of the shadow leaders of the global economy is a fan of big titty anime VTubing? I don't understand it myself, but he is absolutely gaga for it. He's a crazed fan. The shadow leader of most of the world's money is, is a crazed fan of Paul and Elvis. You'll find that most powerful people are obsessive, sociopathic weirdos. It's just something about them, I guess. If you want to see him tonight, I could take you to him. Uh, Splitter? Well, I guess if there is a man higher up than Avum, it's what we wanted to know about. Can we get there by boat? Yes, Avon replies. He's got a vineyard near the water. You're just standing there in the flickering firelight. Well, shoot, let's go meet our biggest and most powerful fan. You flag down your boat. Everyone gets aboard. Splitter says, change of plans. Apparently he's going to turn out the head honcho for us. Can I borrow a phone? Avon asks. Hand him my phone. Avon calls someone and has a really brief conversation. He returns the phone and says, he's available. He'll meet you. He says you can bring friends, but I would advise you not bring very many. Yeah. Okay. This all kind of feels like it fell out of our control at some point here, so it's... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't let him get in your head, Paul. All the boss needs is information, at the least. And we still have Avon for now. That counts for something. Splitter calls up Drac and tells him everything that's going on right now, and the boat heads down to the Hudson Bay, driving on through the night until it arrives at a small vineyard that's gently lit. There's a man sitting outside with a glass of wine wearing a sort of comfortable leisure suit. As you disembark, he waves the glass kindly. All right, I'm ready. I've speculated my whole life on who controls it all, and now I need to know. Wait, the man says. Seriously? I thought this whole time your show was about me. Well, it is. It was always about the guy who runs everything. You were always so close to the mark, I thought. This guy, he actually knows. Everything I've done to hide myself, and this guy, Paul, he knows about it. The animal people, private equity, the lies, the money, everything. He's following everything I'm doing. Oh, uh, no, 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 uh, Paul did know. Paul did know. Nice to meet you, sir. I'm Lowry from Lowry and Lowry Services. I'm Paul's window into private equity. I've been tracking you as much as I can, as much as he has. I'm a huge fan of your work. The man shakes your hand. A pleasure to meet y'all. The name is Absababel. Paul, I called into your show the other day asking about a gift for Avum here. I hope that wasn't a little too on the nose or too forward. Uh, yeah. How, how's the, uh, how'd the advice I give you? I'm getting them set up with a little private island as we speak. It's going to have its own movie theater and a freezer stocked with more carrion than he could know what to do with. A dead animal from every country. In fact, Avum, why don't you come down off that boat and rest your little wings? You're the guy who called us about the vulture man. Oh, uh, yeah. So what are you, like a vampire or what? The boat behind you instantly cracks into flame. There's practically a sheet so hot you can feel your hairs curling up. The vampires that were on board don't even have time to scream. The fire lasts about a second, and what's left of the vessel sinks. I'm what you'd call an angel. Drop down on my knees. Yep, head to ground. We're, we're doing this again. Okay, me too. Nah, nah, gentlemen, I'm fans of you. Really, really. Get up, get up, get up. Oh, come on, have a seat next to me. Avum, fetch us a few Mai Tais, would you? Of course, sir, Avum says, and he hurries off to get some Mai Tais. See, every now and then, a person dies in sin, and when their souls go to hell, they open up just a little pinprick between here and there. Just the tiniest little hole. So small, you might not even notice it. But have you ever heard the question, how many angels can dance on the head of a pin? Well, I can shrink down to smaller than a pin. 
So one day, I squeezed right out of that hole. And now here I am. And here you are, gentlemen. You've been researching me so much, you must have a lot of questions. The mind is reeling, sir. I always knew that there was an easy answer. But hearing from the clam's noise orifice that an angel is making everything complicated. It answers so much in such a simple way that even a dumb guy could understand. The clam's orifice. <laughs> I love that, Paul. You and Elvis are delightful men. And you, Mr. Lowry, I should have known that there was a manager behind the scenes. Every good business, as they say. I've been thinking a lot about what I'd do if I met you guys. And you know, I'm getting tired of making my own servants. They're so predictable, and whenever I start to get attached, they just die from old age. I can't believe it's nearly Avon's time to go already. Seems like just yesterday he was born with big plans to run the finance industry. All my own big plans, of course. But what if I let someone else in on the important things? Paul, what if I let you run social media? Like a social media account? Oh, no, 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 no. That's for interns. I mean control the entire social media oligarchy. You can give orders to any of the people that operate that business sector. I just think you'll finally get to know absolutely everything you ever wanted to know about everything. Can I occasionally just make up my own truths and just make them real? I mean, that's 90% of what social media is. And Elvis, you always struck me as the funny one. Do you want to be in charge of trying fruitlessly to counterbalance Paul's more popular and more destructive messages, but while also having the time to make puzzles by hand? Would I? Well, that sounds like the dream. There's nothing that I love more than puzzles and barely trying to contain Paul. Throw in a pet goldfish and you got yourself a deal. Good, good. And Mr. Lowry, I don't own all of private equity, but I can certainly see to it that you wind up in a prominent position at Res Imperium. Anyone who can see through that tangled web is obviously a genius who should be rewarded. Of course, sir. It was entirely my doing. I'll take it. And so your journey ends, having arrived at the giant fan that stole your stuff, only to be gifted with more than you could possibly understand. All right. Well, uh, that was fun, Mason. Shame about Splitter, though. I kind of like that guy. Yeah, he was our guy. Oh, no, Paul was right. We were massive loose ends. Splitter was totally going to kill us. He totally was. Splitter was just pretending to be nice. I mean, uh, you know, I like his professionalism. You play a game where everyone's evil and you can't hate the guys who stick to that. I'm honestly not super good at the whole pure evil angle, personally. I mean, this was fun, but you know what I like? If we're gonna do evil, it should be like material evil. You know, like stealing, a heist. Would you guys mind if I run the next game? I want to do a big magic labyrinth heist. Sure, I prefer to actually play, so I pass the baton to you. Great. Next time, the great big bingo bone heist. Get excited. So that was Vampire Charade. If you enjoyed that, consider supporting me on Patreon. I am Don somewhere on Patreon. You can look me up under that name. It helps me keep this stuff produced, so I really appreciate those of you guys who are pitching in for it. I try to release each episode one week early on Patreon. Currently, I am behind, but I'm going to get back ahead. Uh, if you just like my humor in general, I've done a lot of stuff over the years. I've got a website, donsomewhere.com, which is basically just a collection of links to other places you can find me at this point, at YouTube, wherever. I've done some animation type things, parodies of fan fiction of My Little Pony, the, you know. If you want to go check it out, then donsomewhere.com. Otherwise, just stay tuned and keep an eye out. Our next episode is going to be coming up. It's going to be a system without rules that I'm not familiar with. A friend of mine ran this game, just as a friend of mine ran the vampire game that Vampire Charade was loosely based on. I guess actually I should say the game had rules, we just didn't really use them. Anyway, uh, I hope you guys are enjoying these episodes and that you have a fantastic week.